Hey guys, I think we got it. Testing one, two. <laughs> All right, we had some audio issues. I apologize. Have uh, my buddy from Lagrange, Illinois, Mr. Stephen Wright, sorting it out. How you doing, buddy? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> he I got it. Sound too good. Audio is uh, audio is working. <laughs> you have strength in numbers here. Yeah, that's right. So, mm. well, cool. Um, so anyway. Welcome to the Tuesday Hang. We have a special guest tonight. Um, we're going to hit him up here in a few minutes. We uh, actually talked for a half hour, and so we don't, we're not going to share too much with you because we already got it out of our system. We dropped the fires. We had to purge all our, you know, we talked about mouthpieces. We talked about being on a road. We talked about business. So we're going to hit all that stuff later with uh, the great Mr. Trent Austin from Kansas City. We're going to touch on him, but um, I just wanted to talk and see how everybody's doing with this pandemic uh 
we all know it's kind of crazy. It's hopefully uh, the, the curve is flattened. Hopefully we still got to watch our distance and we still got to be cool though. You know, um, I know my mom and uh, you know, I'm in the age of, uh, well, I'm not in the age, I'm in a state of age is more, more like it. I live in Florida and uh, man, every, every corner you turn is a nursing home and a hospital. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it's interesting. And I've been in the nursing home a few times. Uh, again, have to be very strict on being, you know, far away from everybody, but uh, you know, it's, we're getting through it. So enough about that. Let's not talk about that. I'm going to do what I do worst. Let's play a little bit. Thank you, guys. Um, that was a tune called Doxy, great Sonny Rollins. The reason I picked that one is last week we touched on a couple things for beginning improvisers and whether they play trumpet, trombone, saxophone, piano. We talked about playing the blues, 12 bar, simple 12 bar form blues. Um, this tune is a, a little extended, so it has some alter changes. It's all based off of blues, it's alter changes, um, extended extended altered blues called doxy so again for the people who are not familiar with that tune the melody would be so that's the melody that's the beginning theme of the melody so that's i believe it's a 16 bar form um on this tune so basically again i still talk about call and response so one four five would be the, the changes or the chords but with this extended blues, it's more chromatic. So again, I just like, like to talk about these things. These are things that we can um, kind of mess around with and also keeping time and being able to play form with yourself, especially when you're confined to being by yourself. Kind of an important thing. So anyway, enough about that. Anyway. So we're going to open up to questions and stuff like this, but you know, there's no for Hey, Steven, how you doing, man? You can, can you talk now? You're right. You're live over there. Yeah, I'm good. I got this, I got this whole thing of CBD products that have chilled me out a little bit. I'm good. <laughs> Where are you? At? I don't even see you, man. I you supposed I'm, to pop up. Oh, you're not popping up. You're popping up on other people's screen though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, cool. unfortunately for you, you don't get to witness the glory of my face. Hey man, you know, <laughs> Yeah, that's all good. Everybody out in, so anyway, in YouTube land. Talking about it. glory, um, you excited about Trent coming? Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I always enjoy Trent. I, I got to tell you, out of I, I really started to get to know Trent a little bit more when we started doing a lot of the, um, a lot of the festivals and the uh, trade shows and things like that. Sure. And I tell you, pretty, pretty much out of everybody that you run into, Trent is the one that 
and always has a smile on his face. So he's, he's always yeah, a good man. dude to run into. So happy dude. Yep. Well, speaking of which, cool. So, you know, Trent Austin is a great trumpet player, um, originally from the New England area. Um, I think I believe I met him in Boston. Now he's in beautiful Kansas City. Not only is he a great trumpet player, he has a wonderful store that's called Austin Custom Brass, ACB. Um, not many music stores that specialize in brass um, are both versed in the music business as great players and great businessmen. Um, usually if you do one, um, you do it really well. So if you're a great uh, store owner or manager, that's what you do. Um, and if you play trumpet, usually your playing suffers because you're kind of, you know, it's a hard gig. You have two gigs to deal with. He's um, one of the true guys I know that is on top of his, he's always in top shape, whether he's dealing with uh, uh, making a customer happy or making a listener tap their feet. His playing has always been very high. So that's been a very kind of a cool thing for me to witness throughout the years. Um, and I, I can say this, I can talk about this because I tried, I dabbled in this myself, man. I worked, worked with Sam Ash in um, music on 48th Street in Manhattan and in Long Island. And uh, it was a great thing for me to do because I learned a lot about gear and I learned a lot about wholesale and retail and about horns were made. However, I noticed, man, my playing suffered a little bit. You know, because I was always dealing with a different left brain, right brain type of thing. So Trent has that vibe where he can kind of switch hit, man. He's a baseball fan, just like I am. So switch hitting is kind of a cool thing. Um, you know, so he never fails when he, he, he deals, um, when he's uh, dealing, whatever he's dealing with. So that's kind of, kind of a cool thing. And I think that you'll see in his personality, it comes out in his passion for what he does. Um, and that's what Steven was saying too. We do these trade shows, which are uh, uh, very uh, brass and uh, well, some of them are music, general music specific, like a NAM, it's all engaging. You got rock metal guys and you got horn guys and Trent's always there in the corner and smiling. And then you get to the smaller venues and it's uh, maybe a, more of a, a brass thing, a brass conference or something like that. So, you know, he runs, I would say one of the top uh, brass stores in the country and he ships worldwide. So I wanted to kind of bring him on and talk about both his store and music, um, his, his great playing. And um, he is actually the, one of the first stores other than Factory Direct, um, my CF horns made by Warburton. Warburton, Terry is great. He sells in Factory Direct, but Trent was, uh, has been a proponent of just keeping positivity with people. He was actually one of the first, uh, our only dealer in America, other than Terry, to take on the CF Horn line. So, you know, um, and that's pretty awesome, uh, Stephen. I'm sure that's kind of been help, help, helped you out, too, as far as fielding questions and stuff, right? Yeah, that was a fun day. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that too because it brings up another point. He was probably one of the pioneers of engaging people on social media. Um, he's been doing this for, for years, man. A thing called he does noodles. And a lot of guys are comping this, including me, are comping this whole thing now that we're sitting home and what do we do? Man, Trent was great because he would go and play horns for people and just give you a tutorial. And so, man, he's very cutting edge. Um, his whole mantra is cutting edge, not just with me, you know. I mean, man, the guy, you know, uh, has a great relationship with uh, Adam's uh, uh, conglomerate, man. Adam's makes great trumpets. They're into everything. And Meal, um, he has a great relationship with Meal, who's the uh, one of the prominent, prominent, top hunt hit honchos over there also he's involved with you know uh, bac in kansas city he's in everybody who, who he's involved with it's just been a positive thing so without further ado i'd like to bring on here my one of my good friends say hello to my man trent what's up what's up dude how are you that intro was way too good i will make sure i send the the pesos your way uh um, the money brother <laughs> don't cash it whatever you do don't cash it Let's see how much. 
Did I mention I, so, hey, thank you for that intro. I, I will tell you one thing, you know, we're all struggling musicians at one point, you know, and I'm still struggling on the horn every day, but oh, stop. I found the one profession that I could lose more money in than being a <laughs> professional jazz trumpet player. And that was opening a business. <laughs> But uh, man, thank you for that intro, man. And I wanted, uh, I mean, when you asked, it was a great pleasure and honor because you, I don't, I think you know this, but I had opened my Kansas City shop up a few months maybe before you came with Billy yeah. to play at Kaufman. And I just sort of passed the thing. I was like, hey man, would you like to come and hang and and do something? And you are our first clinician that we ever had at ACB. So Thanks. Man, what an honor. So, and it's an honor to be here. So, no, and you thanks, and Stephen, so awesome, awesome to be here. So, thanks, man. Yeah, we, that was a really special day, man. I remember you saying that we were the first guys there. And um, it's all, you know, I, I'm sure you feel the same way, Trent. It's always with trumpet players and especially band guys, man. It's all about the hang, you know, hang out and talk here and play and eat, eat barbecue and drink a couple beers. That's a great yeah, thing. Yeah, man. It's, yeah, and we did go to Q39 right after, I remember. So Good stuff. Like, I, ate, I ate my share of brisket that night. You did You did a pretty great job, if oh, I remember. You, you don't you get fat of... like me without eating. Oh, stop, stop, stop. But, uh, you know, you move to Kansas City, you get yourself yeah. a uh, Kansas City Royals. Uh, Trump <laughs> Trump. <laughs> See, it already comes out of the box swinging. Yeah, it comes no, out I'm of the sorry, box, sorry. baby. <laughs> I only have one, one speed, and it's, it's medium slow, so... <laughs> Well, speaking of medium slow and, and one yeah. speed up, there goes my whole thing. Um, I, I tried to silence it tonight again, but we fell, I fell apart with the whole thing. So did we first meet in Boston? You were in Boston at, at Rayburn. Were you at Rayburn? Where were you doing in Boston? Okay, so I first met you, I'm pretty sure when you were, when were you in Maynard's Band in 98? Yes. I, I met you, you, yeah. played a, you played a concert. This Wild? is some fanboy stuff coming, so be oh, careful. <laughs> oh, dude, 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 dude. I was, um, I went and saw you guys, I think, either at Norwood or Dedham High School. And okay. I remember, okay, now I have a question. I have a serious question to ask. Uh -oh. You guys played into fans? Like, you had fans on your stands. Maybe it was so hot. Oh, you know like, what? Was it fans? No. It's, it look, it's, I swear it looked like you were pulling the trumpet bell into the fan. And I, well, we had two things in 98. Um, okay. Colicchio, when, when Chris was working with Colicchio, Chris Colicchio, he had those yeah. rings. Was it the rings that went around the bell? Uh, okay. Monitor rings around the okay. bell. And they look, it was, that was one. And then the other thing we had around that too is we had a clip on, it's crazy. Dr. LED, his name was Dr. And we'd go in, we only played it once. So we'd stick them on our bell. It was like LED lights. We'd go out in the maybe, audience. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just, rem I don't know why I remember that. And maybe that's, you know, maybe I, we it was a sober that night. <laughs> There's no comment uh, replying there. So uh, that might've been it too. But, but I do remember that was the first time we met. And we probably met a few times at Rayburn's afterwards, when yeah. you were in town, either. We do a hang at Rayburn's. That was a hang. Yeah. Frank Vidaris used to do a hang yep. there. I think Frank was working there. And yeah. um, what's our friend, Lee from? Um, Lee Walkowitz. Uh, that's right. He's in DC. Yeah. Yo, Lee. Yeah, yeah so, Lee's, Lee was, um, you know, Lee was huge. I mean, Rayburn, you, it's funny Rayburn's that I. It was a music store and, and it was, is it still around? It was. It yeah, it, unfortunately it's closed. Yeah. Um, the owner passed the owner passed away and um so then it sort of folded um but uh, uh some to that doing was lee was a huge part of the brass yeah. uh world at rayburn and he um took a job at chuck levin in uh, dc which is another great brass oh. institution um so it's funny because i remember going to rayburn as a kid and annoying the daylights out of those guys <laughs> oh they hated me because i would i would go and i'm like i like to try every buck 37 with a reverse lead pipe and, and you know they're all like dude shut up and go practice yeah. and and but i would be cool, like but they were cool with you though that's the thing they were cool you know? they were cool but i never bought anything so it you know it was like they, they would come in and like i think oh this guy again and then once i bought a horn they were like what? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they were always great. And it's like those things, those memories that you have when you're younger that, 
you know, I was like, I always remember you were said it perfectly when we work our whole lives in a practice room and we work so hard at like doing our craft that we forget that one of the big lessons that you never learn in school, well, you sort of do, is sometimes the hangs more important than be a good person, the gig. Yeah. It, it, I, I don't want to say it's more important, but it's 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 a part of the gig. Yeah. Um, and you know, from being on the road and hanging and being in hotels with cats, and yeah. if you don't like guys, it being on the road is not a groove, and it's like. It's one of the reasons I actually, to be honest, it's one of the reasons that the ACB sort of started kind of working its way into my brain because it was like, I was getting really sick of living out of a suitcase. I have so much respect for you guys. Like I remember asking Chris Bodie once, I was like, man, how many days do you do on the road? And he was like, I think I did 270 this year. Yeah. Um, and Clark told me once in the, I think it was the mid seventies, he did 310 days yeah. one year. Yeah, I was. I think my, my mine was about two seventy nine, um, and that was about. I thought I was going to die. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot. It's so intense, yeah. and 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 it's awesome. I mean, come on, you go and you go to these great places. You get you play for people, and people love you. It's like, and people see that part of you at the gig, and it's like, uh, it's unbelievable how you guys. And one thing I will say is that concert at Kaufman was off the chain amazing it was oh, cool. so great that was and, the stadium that's the royal stadium right yeah yeah and yeah. it was the first concert there in 40 years or something that was a fun concert that was really... you, you guys killed it i mean oh, it was cool. like the thing is, it's like it's like one thing it's like you know my first trumpet teacher said this to me he goes because i never really practiced when i was real young he goes you're not a trumpet player you're a trumpet owner <laughs> you just own the thing you don't play it you're just an owner. So I called him like three or four years ago and I, and I, I, I did a video, like a FaceTime and I showed him all the horns and I was like, dude, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but no, it's that it's, it's the thing you don't see that you guys do so well. Cause you guys have, you guys have a wonderful relationship as just family. Right, it really man, is. Yeah. And, and that's so important. It's like to, to have like trust as a musician, your trust that everything's going to be great, but to know like everybody's got your back, everybody cares for you, everybody loves what you do. Well, you're in a dream gig. That's like that. That is that is the dream. I think. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, Trent. You said because it's like a team. You know, you you put it to all about team. or football, or even you look at, or or you, you go you switch it and go into uh you know your uh, retail store. You know, right. I know you have Kyle and Josh and those guys yep. are that's that's your band you trust them and very my band is amazing band. yeah and my band's so much better than i am it's like you know and that's you know that there's the there's the rub you know it's the peep our beauty fourth trumpet player joke right <laughs> yeah. you know like the worst trumpet the worst guy in the band is always the band leader sure uh, in your case it's not it's not the case i mean you're all amazing but i feel like i'm the weak as the game show would say you're the weakest link and uh my staff is unbelievable especially i will tell you it's like this time you know you briefly mentioned it at the beginning this time is rough for all of us you know i miss the thing i miss the most there's two things i miss the most yeah. one is seeing them walk into the shop in the morning you know it's like man these are my boys it's like yeah. this is my team and two is to to, to hang with with customers because yeah. you can't do that um Fortunately for us, we've pivoted. Okay, we're okay, but it's like, you know, it's that one thing. It's like that, you know. I, 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 we had a great hang. Everybody who's watching this right now, we're so glad that you're here, by the way. But yeah. we had such a great hang for like a half hour before, and we were just talking. We're like, you know, how killing is that first concert going to be? When you get the back first from baseball stuff, game, the first hot dog at the baseball game. <laughs> Second hot. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll stop. Um, Fifth hot dog. Come on. <laughs> Friday nights at the K hot or dog. dollar hot dogs. So, so I'm there. So, but um, yeah. Um, but uh, I never thought, I mean, I'll tell you, man, I wanted to be where you were. I mean, like I wanted to play like on the road and I did the road with other bands, not nearly as, as good bands, but I never thought I would be in the position where I am now. 
Uh, not when I was 16, not when I was 26, but I don't regret it. Uh, you know, the one good thing about being in quarantine, you, 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 you said that I could do, do the juggling act and I have to disagree with you, man, because playing the horn and working is really, really tough. You pull it. Um, you got everybody fooled, man. Everybody's fooled. With, I told with you, that. I got one trick, and it's like you know, it's like good, baby. The, the it's the vanna, it's the the sawed off head or something. But <laughs> the one beautiful thing for that for me, at least personally, that's come through this is the fact that I'm actually practicing again, and it's like cool. all of a sudden the trumpet's like, this is not so bad. This I'm, <laughs> You know, now. you say that, man, it's, I got to interrupt you on that because, you know, I caught myself when the first, this whole pandemic started, I became late. I didn't, I want I didn't want to see my horns. I put them away. I'm like, ah. you know, because when you're traveling, you know, you always have to look, okay, what's my next gig? What am I dealing with? You know, I got to keep my chops on my face. All right. You know, and you, you kind of get into a routine. Now there's no routine. So like, I got really lazy for about three weeks and Steven will tell you, I woke up. One day I was really dark and I heard a couple of tunes of uh, a couple of renditions of down by the riverside called Steven mm. like, man, let's play, let's do something. And that's how, awesome. you know, but, and so now I've been playing again, it's been fun, but you know, whatever you do for a living, you don't want to do it for a while. And I think everybody's right. worked past that in this pandemic. Yep. Like, all right, let's go back to work. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's like, sweet. I'm going to be home. Yeah. And for the first three days, it's like the most awesome thing. You're sitting on the couch, you're watching breaking bad for the <laughs> time yeah, i mean it's time. like you've got cheetos <laughs> everywhere it's awesome yeah. and then you're like hmm but yeah. what will pull people out of this like you said you got dark i mean totally you're not you're not the only one we're all we've all experienced that yeah. um i think what's going to happen from this time that we're we're forced focused on some sort of self-reflection mm -hmm. is that we are going to there's going to be so much amazing music that's made so much already, amazing already art that has happened. I really, yeah. I can't, I mean, I can't get over. I mean, I, you're hundred percent right, but I've, I've turned on my computer and heard more music and art and seen more art than I ever seen in my whole life. I'm like, Oh my right. God. It, uh, and I think that's the thing. It's like, you know, maybe we're in a, you know, maybe what's really going to happen is Nobody's been able to go to a concert for a month or two months. Yeah. Now people are going to like really respect art. Now people are going to, we're not the, the, the people that are standing on a stage while someone's eating dinner and they're like, can you tell the band to turn down? <laughs> not that that's the case because Kansas City is an amazing town when it comes to music. Good. But in general, you know, like we're not the hired help. We'll sure. say it that way. Maybe now it's like we are the, the, the the way that people can release and i think we do this concert my wife is an awesome amateur musician she uh oh. plays trump she used to play trumpet one day a year and we would record it as holiday gifts because like she... <laughs> oh come on now stop 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 <laughs> Sorry. no i'll be the i'm the comedy right now so. all right all right no do you juggle um only sometimes <laughs> Uh, but so now we've come up with this thing where she's playing a little bit more trumpet. She doesn't practice, of course. I mean, what? Seriously, you have to practice the trumpet? Yeah. Plays itself. You know, just buy a really expensive one. Um, <laughs> <coughs> one. Real Prince, look, he's choking. He's choking. He's my throat. Choked up. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I play piano. I'm, the, I'm a, a terrible piano player. We sing. He plays hand bells and we call it quarantine with the Austins. And it, it is for our family and friends. And cool. it is just a, I mean, we're like last concert, we did take my breath away. We did like <laughs> close to you. Don't stand so close to me. Like, you know, you, it's terrible. It's corny. It's stupid, but it's that 40 minutes or 10 minutes or even three minutes. If you tune in and you leave, you're smarter than everyone it's um, a it's a that you don't think about like what's going on. Absolutely, man. And we all need it. And so you took days off from your horn because your horn's your life. And now the li you're, you, we think, oh, I'll never be able to play again. It's not true at all. Yeah. It's just like, okay, there's just someone hit the pause button. Yep. We're just waiting for the, re the, the um, you got to cycle the modem. So the modem of life is, is currently mid cycle. Yeah. And uh, you know, we'll figure it out. And like, I tell you, man, the music that, 
the music that's being made now in our places or things like this, where you're doing such an awesome service by giving people your time. I mean, it's all I got. <laughs> that's all we got, oh, baby. But it's also the most precious commodity that you have. It's not yeah. money. Yeah, like no. I have not spent, I looked at my wallet. Like I took out money, like, like panic. Oh, I got to go to the ATM and grab some money. I, I took out some cash. Oh. Every single dollar is still there. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> because you're not going to exchange cash here. here of this. Ah! So, yeah. you know, you're ordering online and, and, yeah. and getting it picked up or whatever, but it's like, you know, money's not a precious commodity. I, I mean, I'm fortunate to say that again. I mean, I know where that sounded bad because, you know, we know that there's a ton of people struggling. Um, yeah. But time is still an incredible commodity that you have. Oh, yeah. And, you know, use it as to your best of your ability. And speaking of time, um, what, what, when, uh, I'm gonna, the segue would be when the time was really young, when you were young, what got in, what, what got you interested in playing and, did you know that's what you wanted to do for a career? Where did you study? I mean, because uh, you're yeah. obviously he's a trumpet player, so this is kind of a cool thing. I always I'm a trumpet geek. I'm a trumpet geek. We all are. Uh, April twenty fourth, nineteen eighty eight. No, that's I saw your old boss play with high voltage. Maynard Ferguson. Wow. And that's the day I wanted to be a trumpet player. Up to that point, up to that point, I had sort of played, but it was not really serious. You know, you can play me Zay Wataneo. Play me Zay Wataneo. <laughs> yes. I think that was high voltage. Dude, you right? totally nailed that. That was that like was, high voltage, I think. That's, dude, that, that just brought me back to like middle school. That's, <laughs> I can't say it. I'm not, I told Carl I'd be PG tonight, but that's, <laughs> what? That's the moment. I mean, and everybody has that defining moment. What was your moment? What was your moment when you knew, like, like you knew, like, this is something I got. It's not like you I know, want to do it, but I have to do it. You know, it's funny you say that, man. I never really thought of it as a moment because I don't, I'm a, I, I like to think I'm a forward thinker or I'm, I'm definitely in a moment type of person, but you just kind of touched on something that I've never been touched on before, big boy. <laughs> Oh, and, that is, <laughs> and that is that is simple you know i remember it was a Maynard concert in yeah. eisenhower park it was an outdoor arena i mean out, outdoor park in long island i yeah. remember the concert now and he was playing with this big band and i remember being like under i must have been eight or nine and hearing wow. the big band play and i was like i want to be that guy you know, wow uh, that's early that's yeah. real early yeah I, well my dad played trumpet and so i knew i wanted to be like my dad but right. the defining factor was seeing that like in eisenhower park and like you know like yeah it was just a great moment for me and yeah that, i never uh, thought about that that's awesome that's so cool that's Steven, that's even yeah do you have a because steven yeah. has another maynard head too what do you yeah. got man i know you have some maynard stories what do you got on that yeah, um, I mean, there were a couple. There were a couple different things for me. Um, one is, and actually, somebody that's watching the stream. Um, my my family was always, you know, involved with music. My dad is a very sax player, um, you know, so music was always George. very important. Yep, George is on the stream. Um, my stepmother is an organist, piano player. Um, as far as Maynard was concerned, it was 1993, and my band director gave me a dubbed copy of Live at Jimmy's and a oh, hall wow. pass. And yeah. the hall pass Ooh. was I could go to I could go to the band room every single study hall and hack away at the way we were until I got like 20 percent of it correct. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's everybody kind of has their their own thing. It's interesting to it's interesting to hear that. Yeah. So Trent, but, that's a yes, great sir. story. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I no, no. That. So, so you know, Stephen had that Maynard moment. You had that Maynard moment. You know, everybody goes and they take different paths. What did you go to school? Did you study? Um, did you have great teachers? Because I want to touch on one I, of your I, mentors, Clark Terry. Of course. Um, I want to touch on him. But where before Clark, that's the horn. All see, we're gonna. Oh, you're killing me, man. See, I, I, you have I, Maynard's horn. You have Maynard's horn. I know it's just so cool. Though. I mean, that's that was Clark Terry flugelhorn. One of one of them. So, but um, I was lucky. I, I went to I went to uh, college on a scholarship. So kids out there that are watching, practice. 
Yeah. Um, practice. We're not talking about game. We're talking about practice. Um, uh, <laughs> I went on a scholarship to play classical trumpet of all things wow. uh, at University of New Hampshire. So shout out to Bob Stibler, my man from UNH. Um, and uh, I went there partially because it was in the, I had a scholarship to Manhattan school and a few other schools, but UNH was, I'm a, I'm a kid from central Maine, man. And I'm a country boy at heart. Sure. And when I went to my audition at Manhattan school, I got off on 125th street thinking, Oh, Manhattan school is like on 122nd. I'll just walk a few blocks. Yeah, I got yeah. dropped off in the wrong part of town. Uh -huh. you know, and so oh, this, well. this little white kid from Maine, you know, going, Oh my God, man, what's going on? So um, anyways, <laughs> I digress. Um, UNH felt like it was in the woods. It was very, it had a very rustic thing. And at the time, CT was still doing two weeks a semester there. So I, oh, I, I had to know that. I had no clue. Was, yeah, that's one of the ties. And he was um, the first honorary doctorate that he got was from UNH Clark in the Terry. mid mid seventies. Clark Terry, baby, the world's greatest embouchure. Obviously, Maynard's amazing too. And you watch those early videos of Maynard. There's, I mean, like, forget it. There's not much better trumpet than you'll ever see. But when I think of learning the absolute perfect, easiest way to play the instrument, just watch a video of CT. It's ridiculously efficient. The flexibility, you have a lot of that. He taught you a lot of that. Nothing. Flex, well, no, man, I, I hear you do hmm. you know, the famous. Um... Yeah. Oh, the, the, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, that just hurt my corners. You know, I mean, it's yeah, like I, and he could slip around so easily, man. Yeah. And you have all that, I, and, and the doodle tonguing, and yeah. that must have, uh, so that that was your relationship at, at, at in college. My relationship was a little bit like I was like, like I would pick him up from the airport in Boston and drive him up to New Hampshire, nice. and we would talk the whole time. That's the hang. Um, That's the hang we're talking about. Yeah, That's the hang. Mean. Absolutely. I learned okay. more in those I learned more in those car rides that I, I could a lesson. Yeah. And but the great thing about Clark, he was a late night hang. He wanted <laughs> to hang Mumbles. until the morning. Yeah. And he would like he would go to the UNH and do a couple classes in the day. Then we would re rehearse maybe. And then he'd be stuck in his hotel room. Like and there's nothing to do. He's like, dude, let bring your horn over and let's hang. So we would watch videos. Um, we would like, we would literally have trumpet lessons. My lesson fee was a bottle of dry sack. You know what dry sack is? No. I'm oh, never... thank goodness you don't. Stephen, do you know what it is? No, I don't think so. It sounds dirty. <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> it's actually a dry, a really dry sherry. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so he, here I am a kid and I didn't drink in college at all. So, um, so he's like, your lesson fee is to bring me a bottle of dry sack. And I was like, okay. So he would yeah. pour me a first glass and, you know, like a little like Taste. paper cup of that stuff. And I would sit there the whole night and nurse it. He's like, yeah, it's great. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> but man the stories he would be playing trumpet laying on his bed upside down and just perfect technique so um but uh it would be 6 30 in the morning the sun's coming up he go into bed i have an eight o'clock class oh wow so yeah that was the but that's the i mean how lucky was i i mean was literally hang, man i was uh, you know those times on the bus you know like the the time that you got to spend yeah on the bus and just to, maybe you didn't go up and pick Maynard's brain, but I'm sure you did because man, you play so great. Obviously, we learn from so many sources, and you learned. Well, it's, some you great know, it's, stuff. it's funny you said it. it's like a direct. People learn two ways directly in, in a one-on-one -on -one situation where you're actually studying, and then what I call it is the indirect hang. And so you know, you know, and it happened with the, a lot of your older generation, I believe, Clark. One of the guys hanging with Nat, Nat Adderley, I used to hang with a lot. Oh, that's right. And he was like, I ain't teaching you nothing. You're hanging. And we'd hang. Nat and called were... Clark once. Nat, call... I was at Clark's house really? on Long Island. Nat and Nat called. And I picked up the phone. I, I'm a huge Nat fan. You know, that's why I, I play know. cornet. Yeah, I know. And you it's are. like, and I was, and I was right. I forgot that you had to hang with Nat. And yeah. I was like, I was like, oh my God. Oh, yeah. Totally fanboy. Like, because. <laughs> You listen to those early, you have blue, 
Billy Joe Jones, Blues for Dracula, Nat Ooh. Adderley played some of the sickest yeah. horn that you'll ever hear. The Jimmy Heath, Nice People record, too. Oh, I and Jimmy that. Heath, uh, Little Big Man, Little where he's bit, playing. Yeah. And Clark's playing lead on that. There's two two horn trumpets. And they go to, uh, what about the, um, is it Nat and Clark trading on one? You know, yes. Trade, oh, my God, is one of my favorite. Um, yeah. Play I mean, it for me. I, I re- yeah, this is killer. It's a what? <laughs> And then, and Nat, he goes, Woo! And he just, he just like starts. And then the second, the next day, he's like, ah! and he's like it's, all above, he's all above the horn. And it's like, they were cutting each other, boy. Woo! But, they, but th- in those days, it wasn't. It wasn't cutting. It was, it was just friendly. It was just playing, yeah, and man. and that's a little bit of a difference than maybe now. Like people think, oh well, you're showing someone up. It's like someone said that to me. <sighs> someone said that to me recently on a session. And I was like, I was like, hey man, you hired me to play. I'm just, I'm just playing. Yeah, playing music. You know. You know? But you know, you say that because, well, you know, because we're we're you know. I, we were lucky because we got to see the geniuses do that. You know, right. I mean, not that we seen, I didn't get to see Clark and Nat play, but you know, right. relationships and hanging with these guys. And Maynard was the same way too. He'd never sit you down and say, this is what you need to do. It was more about the hang. And never, so like, never. you know, here's the testament. We can both talk about that solo. We both know that solo. We know that record. For the young people, you know, there's a lot of great players out there now, but we're, everybody's a copy of a copy of a copy. Hate to say well, it like yeah. that, but you got to bring yeah, in your no. own thing, you know? Well, and you do. of course. And, I, and people you say to me, I'm a, they say, man, you sound a lot like Clark Terry. I was like, man, that's like the best compliment you could ever it give is. me. Yeah. Um, and nobody will ever sound like Clark Terry. Um, you know, Clark says there's three stages of being an improviser. And it, this is so important, you know, imitation where, you know, we don't know how we learned how to talk, you know, we're not reading textbooks on how to talk when we're sitting in a crib, you know, one of these days, drool's coming out of both sides. It still is now. And, you know. <laughs> <For> different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And then, uh, okay. Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, and then one day you realize that if you say mama, you're going to get fed. And obviously, I, yeah. I said a lot of mama. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, so we imitate. We learn through, you know, constant, like, yeah, reinforcement. Sure. Second stage is assimilation, not like the Borg, you know, we're not going, you're going to be assimilated, but <laughs> you know, where you take a style of a player uh-huh. and, and you do this really great. I mean, it's like you go, you know, you say, oh, well, this is this sort of vibe of this player. It could be Freddie Hubbard. It could be Woody Shaw. It could be, yeah. you know, Don Ellis. It doesn't matter who it is. And that's the assimilation stage where it's like, you're, yeah. you're thinking of your heroes and sure. playing. And then third is innovation, which honestly, I don't care about ever getting to. There are very few innovators. That's, I think, where you were talking about. Um, but you know, it's it's different. I and mean, Clark's told me about this. He would have five, six recording sessions a day in New York yeah, in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. And then go play a gig. Yeah. I mean, so these guys were on the horn all yeah. the time. But they and if it, you man. listen to you listen to Nat. I mean, you know JJ Johnson, Eminent. Is it the Eminent JJ Johnson? No, it's not. Um, it's the one where he, they do Mysterioso, and he's playing oh. this, this blues, and he goes right up to a double C, and it's just like no fooling. It's like here it is, yeah. boom, yeah. on cornet, folks. Totally crazy, man. So yeah, you know, I mean that. It, it, those three. I, I just I, I want to rewind for a second. Yeah. For the younger generation, give me those three Clark things exactly. So the middle was assimilation. At the end was innovation. The first one we want to be very duplication, correct? Uh, yeah, I just wrote them on on the. I'm I'm actually looking at the YouTube. I just wrote them on YouTube. Um, uh, oh wait, I might have written them incorrectly. No, uh, I at least I didn't write them incorrectly. Oh. Uh, imitation, assimilation, innovation, and. There is nothing wrong about being imitative. I mean, like, you know, like the great, I'm think about another great trumpet player. He just passed and he passed because of COVID, but Wallace Roney. Yeah. Yeah. Wallace Wallace Roney does not get the credit he deserved. He was an innovator, man. He was 
but the problem people couldn't get his sound was so great yes. and he, but he but he sounded like miles I mean, yep. that's the thing it's like his sound was so deeply rooted in miles's that's sound crazy. guess what that's people go oh he just plays like miles man he doesn't I mean, he, no. his playing was his, very different. Yes, there were harmonic time... line. His the way he uh, harmonic. Oh. Mysteri- I think he did a record too, Mysterioso. Yep. Uh, and the way he would sidestep yep. certain things. Yes, it was out of the vein of Miles, but he had his own yep. thematic development. The way he would sidestep his harmony. The way but, he would even articulate was yeah. different than Miles, man. But if somebody told me I sounded like Miles, like you sound exactly like Miles, I'd be like, yes, that's awesome. Sure. You know, it's like these, these things. It's like, okay, well, you know, like I'm getting great results. It's cool. So yes, we want to, we want to search for our own voice or we want to search for our own purpose, we'll say, mm-hmm. but it's like, there's no better place to go than like studying the, the big people in our language. And, and if your language is improvised music, then you're, you're, you're the big three are Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker, and John Coltrane. Mm-hmm. And, Everybody else is from them, sure. you know. There's like Talk Miles Santana, Tan. Carlos Santana, great. You know, he oh. loved Train, man. He's all about and he, John Coltrane. And he loved Miles, and he oh. loved, you know, he was. Yeah. But he, Hendrix, they, they loved, yeah. I mean, it's like it's we're we are deep. To be deeply rooted in tradition is not a bad thing. No. While still while still thinking about maybe there's something else I could do that's maybe a little bit different outside of the tradition. Yeah, find yourself. It's a hard thing to find yourself. I found All myself right. at the barbecue table and hey, yeah, <laughs> I baby. have to take my glasses off. <laughs> First thing I did when I moved to Kansas City is buy a smoker. So the yeah. next time in your town, when you're in town, I will smoke for you. What do you what kind of this is important? What kind of smoker do you have? Well, see, okay, it's different. For me, it's not necessarily about the smoker, it's about it's the about tech that. around the smoker. That's so, why I'm talking to you. <laughs> I have a very basic master built smoker. It's okay, totally cool. But I, my wife bought me the coolest thing ever, which is this Bluetooth thermometer where yeah. I can be at work. I can my, I work about 15 minutes from where I live. Okay. I can be at work and I get a temperature sensing. And I go, oh, all right, my pork butt is, uh, is at one, uh, 186. I probably should go home so I can start preparing it. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it's, it makes it pretty brainless. If we could, hey, you and I, right now we're thinking... Steven, you got to write this down. If we can think of a Bluetooth it. trumpet practice app that we could just give to someone where they instantly practice. That would be great. <laughs> That's leave true. I, I, made, I made a note. And as soon as I figure out the audio issue that we had at the beginning of the stream, I'll get on that. <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm respect, man, because... You know, Carl had mentioned that we do we do lots of videos and we do lots of work. I mean, this wow. is intense. No matter, I mean, it's like, oh, well, they're just sharing a screen. It's cool. Where are you right now, Carl? I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida. Right. And Stephen, where are you? I'm in LaGrange, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And I'm in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. And it's all going through, it's all going through a web conference, through a broadcasting software, through YouTube. It's pretty badass. I mean, it's, I mean, this is, we, and this is the thing. And Carl, you, I will elaborate on a point you made earlier. And I think this is really important. We both knew this, like, and even though I butchered it, we both knew that. We both knew that Nat Adderley solo. When we were younger, we would live with albums. Live with them. We would live with them. And and I remember this started changing. I taught college for nine years. And I remember when the iPod came out. Yeah. And it started becoming a, it started becoming a game of who could have the most music. So one student would walk in and say, "Hey, man, I've got twenty six thousand songs." And I was like, "Yeah, and you haven't listened to one." They're like, "No, no, no." I was like, "Man, do you know every note on Kind of Blue? Yeah. You know." And it's like every time I listen to Kind of Blue now, after a thousand yeah. times through, it's different. Yeah. Um. So this is a little bit of an old bastard thing. Sorry for any youngsters that are watching. So, um, you know. <laughs> If you want, if you love how someone plays, and it could be, it doesn't matter who, it could be her. I'm not, the first influential piece of music that I ever heard was, hold on, I'll play it as soon as I find man, a trumpet. Play that sucker, man. Play that. I got tons of fun Look horns. This. That's a funny looking trumpet. I love it.
right? Herb. I, I knew my shop had made it when I got an Amazon order from Herb Albert. That's oh, you should have seen me. I was yeah, running yeah. around the shop and it was like, it was so, I mean, it was like that, that song. Yeah. Rise, from 1970, that rise, right? Rise, yeah. From 1979, right? Uh, he was a rock star. Oh, he and was. He did the thing. And, but the other thing that about it is like Herb will freely admit he's not, He's not Clark Terry or Maynard Ferguson. He's not in a jazz guy in that sense, no. But he's but cool. He's commercial. He's a great player. It's the it's the song that when I was like, before I saw Maynard play, I knew that there was something cool about trumpet, but I would, they gave, the first person that gave me a Miles album, I was like, man, this sucks. This guy can't even play the trumpet. So, <laughs> oh my God. You have to kind of, kind of like eating uh, uh, very fancy food. You have to kind of get there. You got to have your grits and gravy first yeah. to figure out what you like and what you don't like. Absolutely. So, you know, or as, uh, what did, uh, De uh, Louis Armstrong said this to Dexter Gordon once, and I won't tell you about what, but, uh, <laughs> he said, son, that's like bringing a hamburger to a steak buffet. So, <laughs> you know what that is, then, then we could talk a little further, but, um, you know, it's the influence. So if you find that you're influenced by something, you know, I didn't, have i don't have the sheet music to rise you know Got or like name a famous name a famous like a quintessential trumpet solo just like think kind about it. The, the miles thing i mean you know, you know like i was but, but, Right. You know, and you know, you, you, you grow, and I didn't look at a transcription. You know that too. Yeah, if you yeah. learn the music with these two things yes. versus these two things, I think you're going to have an advantage Without because, because when you look at a piece of music, you, you become a translator. So if you're looking at a piece of music, I'm not saying that you shouldn't read music. That's not where I'm going. What I'm trying to say is that if you're looking at a piece of music and you don't internalize the music, then it's really hard. Like say you're learning the Haydn trumpet concerto. Okay, well, how many versions of the Haydn do you have? <laughs> this is where students of now have such a huge advantage over students oh, of our era, totally, totally. because we would like, I mean, this sounds like old, old bastard talk, but it's like, I would drive an hour to, to record town yeah, you know, and, and I mowed lawns all week so I can get my cassette tape mm -hmm. of her, you know, like yeah. went to Marcellus Carnival, we'll yeah. say, or whatever. Yeah. But then I had that and I listened to it, listened to it, listened to it. Wear it but out. nowadays, if say, oh, I have to play, I have to play Giant Steps. If I type Giant Steps trumpet into YouTube, you have everything from incredible visit, like Tyler Webb, who's a young trumpet phenom playing it. And then you have someone like John Swanna playing it on EV. And then you yeah. have all these great, you know, like there's a thousand versions. So there's this wealth of information. Um, how do you, how does one internalize that? Uh, the internalization, it's funny you say that, you know, it's, it's, I, I call it, and I'll even go back a little further. It's like the five minute hero, you know, you have all this information and you sound educated and you sound good for a couple minutes and then your bag of tricks runs out if you're an improviser or, yeah, why, you know, are you at, why are you looking at me why are you looking at me oh, man oh stop why are you talking who are you talking to me <laughs> bag of no. trick baby no 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 but Wait, what i'm saying so is also and steven this is funny because we can we can go this way so you know steven you, you have an ipad or ipod or ipad or i i me i i you mm -hmm. a, a thousand tunes and you know, we talked about this. We touched on this many times. It's um, people's attendance of um, not attendance. What's the word I'm looking for? Their atten attention span. Mm -hmm. um, see, I forgot I, my attention span. span, attention span so was short. Too short. I, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Your attention span though becomes you know into this long thing when you had to transcribe these records and you remember these licks and. Now your attention span is oh what it's it was within between two and three minutes right Stephen we did a, you did a study on that right because yeah. I remember you telling me about this musically 
Yep. Yeah. If you if you can keep somebody on a single web page or a single video for longer than forty five to forty eight seconds, you're considered a success. Yep. If, with that Think particular that. video, which is viral. Which is, yeah, viral crazy. videos, eighteen seconds. Yeah, 18 seconds. it's just crazy because and this kind of leans itself. You know, there's a couple things that you guys have been talking about that you know I don't want to I don't want to forget, but um, <laughs> you know. You, you mentioned like the viral videos and YouTube and having that wealth of information, but I think it's very important for the students that are on the stream to also not think that you can get everything that you need from playing MP3s or watching YouTube, because I will personally tell you, if you've never stood on the opposite side of Maynard Ferguson's microphone, you will never, yeah. under, you will never understand the true sound of i mean and yeah, that's go, just one example go back to louis armstrong yeah, <laughs> yeah. all the cats. can you imagine yeah. hearing louis i wish i grew up did i mean like so i've had two moments like that Stephen, and that is such an amazing and this is even more important now so once everybody's able to go out and go to concerts mm -hmm. you better believe you you should be there um uh there are two moments. One, of course, was that Maynard moment. I mean, there are more than one. I mean, I'm yeah. hearing CT for hearing Winton the first time, but I will tell you the first time I heard Nozzle Brass, oh, um, wow. mm -hmm. I had never heard seven people play with the following. The sheer amount of volume that they could play is ridiculous. If you haven't heard them live, you don't, I mean, it's like, it's like drum core. It's wow. like the sound is like here, but it's perfectly in tune, perfectly in time. And one guy's floating upside down. That's amazing. I mean, so it, it, it's one of those things once you see like, you see, we think of the perceived level and everything sounds good on recording because you can make 70 takes. That's one of the things that I'm really adamant when I put stuff up, unless I have a technical failure with my microphones, like it's first thing. <laughs> Well, we all do, yeah. but it's like, uh, you know, it's always first take because it's like what you see is what you get, good or bad, this is it. So, um, we love that because that, you're honest. There's an honesty yeah. thing that happens too. People, you know, it comes to a humble thing too. Uh, you know, if you're honest with whatever you do, man, that should come out in some way, shape, or form, or another. And that does, yeah. in, I'm sure, in your business too. I mean, here it is. You put it right out there. You know? Well, and we've had people like, I mean, I did a, re, a, a video recently and it's funny you mentioned viral videos. This is a kind of a viral video all of a sudden of us. I mean, I did it partially because I have not many horns here at my house and I can't get to the shop. So I was like, I'm going to do this stupid video yeah. of the cheapest trumpet I have with the most expensive trumpet I have. Um, cool. And it's like going kind of crazy. The point of it being, you know, hold on a second. <laughs> Yeah, you don't, you don't have any horns in this house. There's another no, one. <laughs> Listen to the music that this trumpet's making. <laughs> Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? <laughs> Carl Fisher makes the music. You know, <laughs> Stephen Wright makes the music. I just move my fingers really fast and hope for the best result. But the thing about it, when it comes back to it, it's like we... And we were talking about this again. We had a really happen in 30 yeah. minutes before we started because we were talking about, for instance, um, what, you know, like finding the right match of a horn versus a player. And, Very important. and eventually, you know, I saw a great video. I don't know if there's a great video of uh, Winton uh, playing at the Smithsonian playing Louis Armstrong's trumpet. Oh, wow. I, I did see this. Yeah. He's out in the crowd. And he, so, so there's some mic issues because obviously he doesn't have a mic around. He sounds ridiculously great. And Tom Williams, who was playing in the Smithsonian band, gave him his mouthpiece because his mouthpiece was made for his okay. trumpet. It wouldn't fit into that cell mark. Sure. So not only is he playing a horn that's not his, he's not playing a mouthpiece that's his. And, that's uh, and you know, because you, because of your, your really great work with Gary, how important the mouthpiece is. Yeah. Um, it's, and that's actually one of the reasons I started my company. It was also that's that. where I was going with this. Why oh. did we start this? This is, no, 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 no. so go, but, go, go, go. I love this. But, but the, but, but you make the sound. Yes. I make the sound. Steven makes the sound. Then 
And we start thinking about, okay, why do we play what we play? Now I'm going to add, I love, and you know how much I love your trumpets. That's why it's a horn that we sell. We only sell horns that we love. There's a lot of people that want to sell at our shop, but we're like, man, I don't, one, I might not have interest or two, I don't fully get the concept or three. Yeah. It's just, okay, well, that's just another something. It's, there's copy something that has to copy. stick out. Yeah. Like, okay. Like the Shago Gonchorn, which, okay, it's the blingiest trumpet ever. Killer. It's the coolest trumpet ever. It's broken. If, for people who don't know this horn, it's uh, made for my friend Tomas Gonch, who's one of the five best trumpet players in the world. Without a doubt. Present company excluded, of course. I mean, you know, um, um, but, um, it, the, and the whole reason that the, these are rotary valves, like a German style trumpet, but the bell is bent so that these little levers here can actuate. Now this trumpet has a very unique sound. It's also ridiculously expensive. I'm not doing this just because I, it was just one of the horns I had at my house. But this is different than you know your Yamaha Zeno or whatever. Sure. Your horn, Carl. Your horn is distinctly different oh, because it has a vibe. And my horn. This is the horn that I play all the time, which I call Copernicus. Cool. Obviously, cool. It, it's pretty sexy. But it's like you know. Because I do so many different, th we both do different things. Yeah. Like you can, you can, you could probably play it on Billy's gig, but it'd be a lot of work. Your horn fits it perfectly. Yeah. Well, everything has it lends itself to its gig, you know. And and w explain to me about that Copernicus because I, I, it's a kind of a chameleon. You could do a lot of different things with it, uh, right? Uh, in your wheelhouse. I, well, I did. I made that horn with uh, my friend Neil Adams, who's one of the greatest horn makers yeah. in the world Love that guy. um i made it because i was do i started because of my shop i don't have a lot of opportunities to play anymore because the shop takes most of my business um and time sorry time, yep. um and i needed something that i could just jump on a small jet and go with but just bring one horn so with okay. two or three different mouthpieces i can get the sounds that i need as a musician sure um and it looks really cool it's a beautiful horn it plays great too it's a great player well, you know, we, we have a, we have a phrase in our shop, people hear with their eyes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so when somebody, and that's, you know, like it's, and it really is, you know, that what's the classic paradigm of that, right? It's like the shift is somebody walks in with Copernicus, but maybe can't really play. And then there's this guy that shuffles in with the old beat up, you know, like yeah. I have this great cornet that I bought from one of uh, an estate of a great trumpet uh, engineer. Okay. Um, and I paid 400 bucks for it. And it's like one of the best horns I have. Wow. So, um, you, but, but seriously, when you were thinking about designing the horn with Terry, what went into that? Cause I know you played a, sh I mean, this is the bad thing about being a trumpet geek folks. <laughs> I knew what he played before, you know, like, and oh, he had this modified and this and this and his gold and engraved. Okay, cool. You know, like I'm not stalking you, but, um, <laughs> what made the what made the difference when you when you made that switch you know so the i could go on and on uh the the the, the most direct answer for that question would be what made the difference is anything that i'm going to play has to outplay what i'm playing previously um, you know, I want to go forward. And so when I left Yamaha, I was with Yamaha 10 years, I had some two great tricked out Yamahas that mm. were custom and they played great. Um, when I left Yamaha, um, I, you know, I was kind of like you, man. I, I, I talked about this last week. I have a wonderful trumpet collection. I have great horns. I could, you know, so I wasn't really looking for anything. I, st I stumbled upon Terry. Um, mm -hmm. at a trade show I, I knew terry from 25 years back i always got along with him well and you know he had some trumpets and i played a few of them and i was like okay you know it was cool you know but me being me and you being you like certain things lend itself better sonically for your for your you know that help you get a sound out and so i had a couple comments on what i thought and you know on kim kim was there and so mm. was jerry lopez was working great with yeah at the time and, you know, so we had dialogue and, uh, you know, Terry's like, come by the shop. And so it became more of a hang again. It, was, it wasn't, uh, you know, and I told him what I liked and he happened to have, he was one of the few guys 
that didn't have any preconceived notions about it has to be this, it has to be this. I knew mm -hmm. I wanted a medium bore. I knew I, I wanted an over five inch bell. I knew yep. these things from my con days, from playing con, from working with Besson, from playing con vintage one, going through all, exactly. There, there's a beautiful con there. I only oh, brought that to tease him. Oh yeah, I, I'm gonna have to buy that. You know, you kill right. me with that thing. It's oh my god. So you know, I I knew kind of what my parameters were, and so he's like, oh, we can do it. We put it together and we worked on it. And man, Stephen will tell you the first day I, I we put he put together a horn. I got in my car. It's about a two and a half hour drive back to my house from Terry's. Got in my car and called Stephen. He goes, oh, how'd it go, Stephen? Yeah. Jump on this. I, remember the, the first day, that I, first first conversation we had? I don't remember the exact words, but I do I do remember that the, the feeling was we were going to be able to put something, you know, I, I, I don't want to use the word special because it sounds, you know, it's, I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm partial to it, but it was going to mm -hmm. be something that had a vibe to it. That's right. You know, it wasn't yeah. going to be a stale box sound horn. It was going to be something that was distinct that fit Carl. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with the industry standard. I mean, like yeah, the yeah. thing about it is, I mean, most major, um, most major professional trumpet players play a very straightforward instrument mm -hmm. and a straightforward mouthpiece. There's nothing wrong with that. This horn that you're talking about that you guys worked on, it, it I mean, you said it perfectly, Stephen. It has a vibe, just like Copernicus. There's nothing in the world that's like that horn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. um, even though I've already seen three companies copy it, which is cool. They haven't really copied it because they don't know. One of the reasons we copper plate it is to hide the alloys that we use. So, okay. um, so, but a um, there. <laughs> little uh, trick, trick little of the trick. trade, you know, you can't, a magician doesn't reveal all those secrets. <laughs> Here's a rabbit in the hat. <laughs> right. Whoa, I'll take that. But, you know, it's, and it was, I know, like, I mean, you had a great relationship with Yamaha and they're an incredible they're company. I mean, Yamaha people. is Yamaha. They're great I mean, people. they're awesome. And let's just, let's just have a word for our, our old buddy, um, at Yamaha. Uh, should we, uh, Yamaha was a family of great people. And mm. so we, we did lose Ed. Um, right. Sorry, I didn't mean. I just recently, just right? Of, yeah, was it two, recently, two or three, weeks, three ago? weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And every, and the, the, you know, it's funny you say this, though. The industry is small enough. Everybody knows everybody, and there's a lot of respect. You yeah, know? So, you, it, you know. it's it's definitely. I mean, I'm I have a good friendship with Bob Malone. I and, and it's like we actually just were on a chat a few days ago, and it's like, and good I job. love what Yamaha does. I love what Con Summers yeah. does. Terry Werburn, by the way. T talk about a tie into this. Terry taught me how to use my CNC machine. He flew up to Boston and taught me how to use my CNC. And then when I was getting ready to move, I was thinking about selling my CNC and guess what's in his factory now? Your CNC machine. Well, it's his now, he paid off. Yeah, way to go, Terry. But um, but like seriously, and so this, I mean, it is, it is a very, very small world. And, and the good thing about I think this and where we're going is like, you know, people know how tied in. I mean, like yeah. people know how tied in. Mule is like one of my best friends. Yep. On the president of Adams and I were on the phone together today. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like a business chat. It was oh. just like, hey man, how you doing? How's your right. wife? How are things? And it's yeah. like, I mean, I have and I have so many great horns here in my collection, but I'm gonna play an Adams when I'm Part of me, I've had too much diet, Dr. Pepper. Um, <laughs> Dr. Pepper. But um, it's like it's this feeling of family, yeah. and it's the feeling that you like you you could. Say, I know how those hangs are with Terry, especially oh. when you're working on stuff. Yeah. They can be a little passionate, they can be a little intense, but in the end, it's all about it's all about taking the perceived level and raising raising yeah. it. That uh, so. not, that was very. Exactly. That's what really drew me to Terry. Even back 25 years ago, he had a passion just like you do about it. Not that other people don't, but like I said, I wasn't really trying to recreate something. I was just, yeah. you know, when we first put it together, I'm like, wow, this combination has a lot of special. And it's not like, a, I mean, it's not like a con. I will speak from my experience because Adams has a horn in their line. That's a 438 bore. Sure. Um, 
a true small bore. But that horn is great. And it's great for so many people like, you know, like Dante Winslow and people like that who play it in an incredibly high level. Um, It doesn't have the same vibe as the con. It has its own vibe. Just like I I should have shown you, Adam's just made a copy of the old recording. Um, And, but it doesn't play like my old recording that I showed you before. Again, we had a little hang before this. Maybe there was a B-roll that you can like lay onto them afterwards. (laughs) But um. I know we've gone like so many different tangents. Welcome to the world of ADHD, folks. Um, <laughs> I know you had a bunch of questions, but we've just been hanging. So no, no, no it's, it's actually it's actually what's nice is the hang is it's kind of uh, dictating where we were going anyway. It's just cool. you know, so you know what made you what made you jump into you know you, you played great horns. You always uh, I you know you studied, you taught, you had great teachers. What was the deciding factor gear wise and say, I want to open up a trumpet store. I'm crazy enough to have speak yeah. to do this. No, now, what I, was that? I'm still crazy. The, the, it started with mouthpieces because there's a lot of great vintage mouthpieces that were really popular. Like think about what everybody played. I showed you like, um, yeah, check this stuff out. More, as I mean. These are more like novelty mouthpieces. These aren't really what we make in the line, but that folks, yeah. Let me show you a normal mouthpiece first. This is my, it's like a one and a half C, okay? Right. Let me just give you a little demonstration next to El Gato, Woo! which is, that's Cat Anderson's mouthpiece, which it's the most amazing. Now, Cat Anderson's mouthpiece was made by this uh, African-American trumpet mouthpiece guy named Charlie Allen. I think he was in Pittsburgh, but I'm not sure. Okay. And, and he made mouthpieces for a bunch of cats. This mouthpiece was Louis Armstrong's, which you can't really see, but it's copied in the Giornelli blank. Um, and it's got a double cup and it's got a super flat rim. So I have always had a fascination on what my heroes played. Clark, you asked how it really started, is that Clark, back in the day, oh, uh, yep. yeah, but not just what is old Giornelli's, that the one seven. says Clark Terry on it because it was one of his. Um, cool. And he... Clark gave me a shoebox full of mouthpieces when he moved from, uh, I think, from Long Island. Island to, yep. uh, he moved somewhere close to William Patterson. If I, if yeah, I never went to that place, but then I went to the place down in uh, Arkansas. But uh, Arkansas, I'm sorry. But he goes, man, I know you're into this stuff. He didn't say the stuff, but you, I know you're into this stuff. Here, have this. And I go, and I opened this shoebox, and it was a small like shoebox. And I said, man, what's this? And he goes, oh, that was uh, one of Dizzy's mouthpieces. And I'm like, oh what? Um, and I go, what's this? And he goes, oh, that was one of Miles's piece. But he didn't really like that. And then he goes, oh, well, this one, I think this is it. Yeah, this is, we call this the TA Screech. This was Charlie Shaver's old mouthpiece. Oh, wow. And so I, so when I started thinking about ways to survive off the road, I knew I'm, I'm like a geek. I'm a gearhead. I'm such a nut I when it comes it, to man. stuff. I love it. One of my friends said this to me, and I think it's pretty applicable. He goes, "You're the king of Trump. Uh, you're the king of the trumpet geeks." And I was like, "Well, cool. I'll take. I'll wear that with a badge of honor." Um, so I started thinking about like what made Clark's mouthpiece so special, what made this guy's mouthpiece. But none of them, to be perfectly honest, most of them will say, don't they don't work with the modern player. Uh, equipment has changed. Sure. Um, Playing demands, the playing demands have changed. And in other words, like when you were working, you had to be able to play any type of gig, right? That's why you probably have, you know, three or four different main setups that you play on your, your stuff with Gary. So it was like, so I, I was like, what makes these things tick, but how can we make them a little bit more applicable towards a modern player? So that's kind of where I started. And if everybody's still awake, I'm sorry. Um, you know, so you know. we get, we get, we get people, to sleep. No, we get people killer, still awake. No. Well, I just oh, I'm love, sorry. I, I, I asked this. I'm sure a lot of people are very interested. I mean, because, you know, it's it, it's great to see what really makes people tick, you know, mm. and, and there's a lot of commonality between um, not just trumpet players, man. I, you know, playing saxophone. I play a little sax. I play some trombone. Each instrument has its own little set of uh, tricks and, mm-hmm. and tips, and everybody is, uh, you know, 
on a high level wants to share it. And it's always yeah. like, it, it's always, a, it's funny. It's a clicky community in each type of instrument. You know, piano yeah. players got this other thing going. And it's Stop talking about cool. symbols. Don't talk about symbols, dude. Oh, forget you it. hang yeah. with the drum. Um, every yeah. year at Adams, they have this big festival called Drum World. In okay. fact, the first time, the first time I went out um, is when I designed my first trumpet with them. Um, and was, what was the first horn on that? I'm it was curious. the first one was the A1, and it's okay. the first generation. The new A1, which is this thing, this is the new A1. It's completely redesigned. Um, okay. But cool. But the first time I went out, they had their Drum World Festival, and Steve Smith was the big guest. So they're like, "Hey, you play jazz. Steve plays jazz. Why don't you guys get together and play?" And we're and go. he's like. And we ended up doing this like really cool trio with drum, uh, percussion, like drum kit, yep. vibes, and trumpet. And, wow. and and it was a whole bunch of rockers, man. Killer, like Ian man. Peace I didn't know he was, was with there. you guys. Wow. Ian Peace was there, and there were a whole bunch of rockers. Uh, yeah. I don't know if uh, Tomas Lang was there that year, but anyways, but it was like right. it's hardcore drummers, and they're listening to me play like free with Steve Smith. It was kind of the bomb. But anyways. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we all, like you said, we all have our little things that we talk about and we worship and we sort of, we all want, hey, we all want that baseball, that baseball bat that gets an extra five feet off the Absolutely. bat. Absolutely, yeah. We all want something, we all want something that makes our lives easier. And I think about it this way, and I'm sure, I would think you think it the same. When I put my horn up to my face, the horn that I played, the horn that's built for me that I helped build. Yeah. I don't think about the instrument. People ask me, what are you doing? And I was like, I think of a line in my head and I shapes, try to play. Shapes yeah. and colors and yep, exactly. where you want to go. Think about the music. If you can I get don't think all the mechanics musically. Right. I can't blame my instrument. That's for damn sure. And I, I that tried. Level, it doesn't work. <laughs> there is a level there. I mean, and it's like, in some ways I do regret putting up that $200 plastic trumpet versus a $9,000 <laughs> trumpet video. Cause some people are like, Oh, you're so great. And I'm like, Oh no, no, no. That thing, the trumba trumpet is like, it's, it's plastic, like, the, right? it's, all it's, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the base mission was to say, Hey, this is the musician. This, this That's the is tool. the amplifier. This yeah, is, the tool. this is, this is this is your own personal Excalibur. Call it whatever you want. I know that's how you feel with your horn. Absolutely. That's how I feel with mine. Yep. Um, not to say that I don't have other good horns in yeah, around. So. Absolutely. So you got you know you, that's great. And then obviously there's different flavors, and you got into uh, you know the the history. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm and I, as you know, we have a lot in common with history of jazz trumpet players. You know yeah. what 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 Freddie Hubbard liked to play on, what Lewis liked to play on. Oh, like, yeah. You know, and so you can go crazy and geek out with that. And so, the biggest thing I tell you, Carl, is the, the biggest reason I opened my shop is yeah. I, uh, in addition to the mouthpiece thing, I remember being the the person who didn't really know what they wanted, and they would go into a music store. And back in the day, I mean pre pre eBay, we'll say, uh -huh. I mean, you could go into Rayburn music and you could say, I want to Bach 37. They go, we have 25 in stock. I mean, there are very few stores that are like that. Now Dylan yeah, is an incredible music store. Um, the they have a great selection. Chuck Levins, horn guys out in California, mm -hmm. Schmidt music in Minneapolis. There are stores that still are like that. Sure. Uh, our store, of course, but it's like, but one thing that I think separates at least this is the way I, whoa, hello. I don't know oh, what that did. See those chops. <laughs> hey, close up. <laughs> I, did, I, I didn't press anything there. That was kind of scary. So gosh, delete that scene. Um, <laughs> we lose Steven. I think he's sleeping on his desk. No, oh, I think he just, he, no, just he had a heart attack for crying out. But one of the differences and maybe the only difference is that all of the guys that that work at my shop are really great musicians. They yeah. all play. Kyle great. plays great. I Kyle Josh plays great. Play Josh plays great. Of... Chris is an incredible classical trombonist. Patrick yeah. is a wonderful cornetist and classical yeah. trumpet player. Yeah. So our, our ears are tuned to help them. Our mission yeah. is to help someone. So when they come into the shop, we want 
to make sure that when they leave the shop, and it could be an eight hundred dollar trumpet, and it could be a three thousand dollar trumpet. It doesn't necessarily. It doesn't. It doesn't matter to us. Yep. And the reason for that is because we want people to be confident with what they have is the best thing that for them. Sure, that's and noble. And that's huge because, like you said, what's the biggest thing for me? It's trust. Like I put myself out yep. a little too much, probably online. No, it's great. I put myself out. And the point being is like, I want people to know that, you know, when you come to the shop, it's like, I'll make you a cup of coffee and we're going to hang. But if you play the horn that you currently play and you sound better on it, I'm going to be like, dude, enjoy the coffee, but you sound better on that gear. No, all you have is your word. It's a very honest thing. Uh, You know, you're as good as your word and it's very apparent. Yeah. I had good parents. What can I say? So, Hey man, we're lucky that way. Hey, you know, since uh, Trent and I have been going uh, pretty much on full blast. Has there been any good questions about anything, yeah. Stephen, that we could field? Yeah, we got top, a couple. Everybody uh, gone? <laughs> no, no. Actually, you get the same amount that we had at the beginning. Um, Two people. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah <laughs> my mom yeah. and your mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's too my, late for my, my mom, I think. So, but uh... <laughs> well, we got people holding off on their Ambien for the night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, I'll be right, right with you in just a few. <laughs> so, uh, no, but but, but, uh, but really quick no, before I, I get into, it. love to answer any questions that you guys have. I mean, I feel like I've been rambling, so I apologize. No, uh, good. Stephen, field a couple questions, and, and uh, both Trent and I will tag team them. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, one of the things that came through over over text is actually based on what you guys were just talking about. And it's something that we run into with mouthpiece conversations all the time is it, at, at, this person is still learning on when to stop thinking about the numbers and start thinking about the feel. And yeah. this is something I mean, Carl can tell you, I mean, I field mouthpiece questions for his line all day long, yeah. and I'm sure you do too, Trent. At some point, oh, it's the, the 636 diameter versus the 634 diameter versus this yeah. shape, it, it, what does it feel on I'll the you, How does it feel on I'll tell face? you a quick story about that that will, that will sort of solve a little bit in this regard. Um, so when I first got into doing my mouthpieces, I had a like the perfect 3C in my head and the perfect 1.5C and the perfect what? I have a friend who is a, who does aerospace work. So he has some really high tech CMM reverse engineering tools. Okay. So I sent them to him and he goes, oh man, you know why you love your one and a half C so much? Cause I always felt like I was He-Man on it. I was like, man, I sound so good on this one. I sound so good on this. Like, he, goes, he goes, man, you know why you love this mouthpiece? And I was like, no. And he goes, it's a five C. It was, it, and so he overlaid a five C and it was literally exactly the same. Miss Mark. It was stamped. So talk about a downer because I was like, man, this <laughs> this one and a half is the bomb, man. I sound like, you know, I sound like a combination of Bud Herseth and Maurice Andre and Hokon. <laughs> yep. No, uh, yeah. you know, Hoyland Hardenberry, Barry, but not Hokon. Um, yeah. The thing about it is, this is also this thing about technology and where we can read and, and there's so much information out there in a great way mm-hmm. yet there's almost as much in a bad way and i don't want to sound negative in that regard because here's the deal the thing about it is we need to we need to improve people's playability no doubt but we we get paralyzed so easily by you know what's my r4 angle and it's like mm-hmm. yeah i could tell you on my cad program and it, I can tell you what that is. I mean, that's no problem. But the point being is, how does it feel? How does it sound? Now, this is where people like yourself, Stephen, come in, where you've had deep experiences with designing this equipment where you can go, okay, here's what I hear and here's what I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a little bit hard on both ends. I mean, we, we Mark Curry, an awesome mouthpiece maker, yep. has the best line, period, when it comes to this. No mouthpiece has ever missed a note by itself. Yes, correct. I mean, it's cold, it's harsh. And our job, the mission of my shop is to improve people's lives so they, they have so much more joy and fun yeah. when it comes to playing. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the end result is still like where you want to, you know, you want to know. But it's almost like where you have 25,000 songs on your iPad, but you haven't listened to anything. Yeah. I, 
have a friend, I will keep his name out of this conversation, who has over 1,500 mouthpieces. Yeah. And it's not me. <laughs> I'm well, actually, like actually, it is me, but, but we have, <laughs> ours are for sale. Yeah. But um, the thing about it is like, and it's not necessarily where he's looking for that magical bullet. He's just so enamored by design and the different yeah. shapes. And like, he has a whole set of Monet mouthpieces. I've never seen him. We used to play brass quintet gigs all the time in Boston and never saw him on one. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, I got all of them, prana, non prana, you know, LT and regular. And I'm like, and I'm thinking, holy crap, that's a lot of money, man. Yeah. I was like, no wonder you're driving like a, you know, 25 year old Subaru. I mean, it's like you just invested all your money into <laughs> mouthpieces. Yeah. Oh, what's that you saying? Know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go one step further. Um, so that is a great synopsis um, of you know the mantra of you know. You, you think you have a one and a half C and it's mis, mis, mismarked a five C and you know, um, things could be done in factories um, mm -hmm. when maybe they had one too many or didn't have one. Too Friday many. morning or Monday, uh, Monday morning, Friday afternoon mouthpiece. Consistent consistency is a big thing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'll even go one step further. I had it today. Um, a friend of mine and he's not a, he's a student. He's um, he's an adult and he's a well accomplished bass player. I might even mention his name later. <laughs> Maybe he's on. I might get in trouble if I mention his name, but he's an unbelievable bass player, a friend of mine. And he said he, he wants to play the Star Spangled Banner for uh, the first uh, responders. He lives in New York and his awesome. deal is at seven o'clock. He wants to play, you know, awesome. like, uh, you know, so he's really working on it. And so he goes, I got your mouthpiece. You know, I actually gave uh, his dad a mouthpiece back 20 years ago when his dad passed away uh, since then. But he's like, I got your mouthpiece. I'm really trying to get it together and blah, blah, blah. And he was really having problems. So I did a FaceTime with him at six o'clock tonight. You know, he's a buddy of mine. Hey, how's it going? Play me. And he's playing and he's struggling. And I'm like, what other mouthpieces do you have? I didn't tell him. I, 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 he didn't know which one was which. I said, just put, put, start putting them in. And he says, should I tell you what I am? I'm like, no, nope. put them in. And I'm like, that one sounds, you know, I had him do a couple play tests. And he was revelate. There was a revelation. Like this thing sounds amazing. I'm like, yeah, keep it. I said, now tell me what it is. He goes, it's a Vincent Bach. I'm like, it's a three C. He goes, yes. So for him playing a three C was great. And again, this guy is just playing, trying to play scales and get uh, long tones out. He hasn't played in 40 years and he's a really accomplished bass player awesome. and he's a music and you know, don't play my mouthpiece, dude, you know, get your money back. I gave it to his father, but it was really funny. It's like, and he was very, he's like, oh, I should, maybe I should play a seven. I'm like, that's what you're going to play. It sounds better. Oh, sure. It's all oral, you know? Yeah. I have three yeah. rules. I have three rules. Yeah. I'm not going to go there, man. <laughs> if it looks right, it's right. And I'll show you something that doesn't look right. Okay. So I always love doing this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. The tongue controlled Amisher. <laughs> so, rest in peace, Jerry. Um, but, like, <laughs> but that doesn't look right. Even though Clark said that when he grew up, there was a guy in St. Louis that actually played with his tongue really? as, as a set. He didn't play, he like played fourth trumpet in like the swing band, but yeah, um, Pete Beauty. <laughs> yeah, right. that, 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 that. you gotta watch the fourth trumpet bit if you haven't seen it, by the way, Pete but Beauty, man. that obviously doesn't look right. So that leads to the second one of these three, which it doesn't sound right. Yeah. I mean, it does not sound right. Yeah. And I can tell you from the third perspective that you can't tell, but I can tell it certainly doesn't feel right. So when I'm working with a customer, um, and even in my own daily practice, I use those three rules God, every God. time I play. If it yep. looks right, it's right. I that's what, another reason why I do so many videotapes, because sometimes when I'm going through some chop issues, I can actually see them on the videos. Okay. And I go, oh, man, what are, why is my horn position changed? Oh, you man. know, like, um, but Interesting. a great professional player like you, Carl, three out of three, even though some days you know it doesn't feel right because maybe you had to no time to warm up or today you're... was horrible i mean a horrible yeah. playing day today i was like it sounds great it sounds great though oh, it sounds nice. great from ours you know like 
from from the personal perspective, I'm sure you're going, mm -hmm. yeah. but from our the the audience right. perspective, it sounds awesome. So yeah. the, the the pros go for three out of three, but they can survive with two out of three. Like Miles, he played down like this. Yeah. Everything against him. He, he went to Juilliard. If somebody goes to Juilliard, they can play whatever way they can play. Absolutely. Yep. So I think we Sorry. answered that. I think we beat yeah. that one. Sorry. <laughs> we beat that, that one pretty. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to kind of burn through some of these really quick uh, cuz there's been cool. some people that have been waiting the the whole time which is which is awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um we got Brian R saying, "Hey, long time no see." Allison is on from St. Louis. Thank you for joining for the third week in a row, Allison. Um Jordan Canner, uh Carl sounds great as usual. Thank you. Um yeah. Hey, Carl, Carson and family are here. You're amazing. My man, Carson, Carson. Carson and family. Carson actually bought Horn 25, the CF4 ah. Burton. He's got 25, and I'm jealous because Carson's got a nice horn than I do, man. He's got, <laughs> so he's got the horn says, super plated. Um, and you actually, Trent, you actually get him lacquered, don't you? You like him I lacquered. Do. Yeah, yeah, I do. Which is kind of a cool thing. Um, yeah. You know, I, I never. I was. Just, everybody asked me. You know, my Yamahas were always gold plated. And I had great engraving, and the horns look so pretty. And you know, I had a couple guys um, say, "Man, why is your horn so beat? It looks like it's you know." For I actually got two of these horns, um, and we were working on them up up until you know we spent a lot of time working on them. I just never had time to actually go right. get them plated. You know, I actually, and then I actually fell in love with, I played a, a lacquered one and I'm like, man, I kind of like the raw brass. It has a different yep. uh, feel to it. It vibrates more. So Carson just got a silver plated horn. Yeah. And actually his family came over here and they played my whole collection and they were looking at, you know, some different things and Yamahas were great. And so we yeah. had a nice hang with them and, you know, he, the kid sounded good on everything. I call him a kid. He's, you know. He's not 98 or 58, but he, uh, he actually, I think he just turned, he got the CF horn on his 17th birthday. So yeah, happy birthday. That's great. Yeah. Oh, it's... yeah. So yeah, well, yeah, and he actually sounded he has really good on that horn and, um, you know, yeah, he would sound good on anything, but again, it, it, what, you know, equipment really lends itself to a certain type of player and what they want to play. And it's always nice to have a leg up on the competition, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and actually Carson's uh, asking a question um, any advice for keeping a beautiful new CF horn silver plate trumpet clean I'm going to leave that to the master Trent hit hit, hit him tell him Simple. <laughs> I mean the first thing that happens with, with plated horns is that they'll scratch quite easily so put your horn in an anti-tarnish bag and it could uh, they're commercially available online. You could probably find them. eBay. They um, buy an eBay that sells really good ones. Oh, the guy in Texas. Those are yeah. great. They're like 45 bucks. I love those. Like, oh. Totally worth it because silver scratches quite easily. And um, also, if you have, I have acidic hands. Um, so if I touch a silver plated horn, it builds up a film on the outside, almost like there's like, you know, like just like muck on the outside. So two simple things. One, Wipe your horn after you play every time with a microfiber cloth very easily. Almost any microfiber cloth for your glasses or what have you will work. Two, if you ever get a bunch of fingerprints on them, you can use the ammonia-free Windex. Big thing, ammonia-free. You spray really? it on there and wipe it off with the, with the cloth and it will take all of those fingerprints off. So ammonia without having to silver polish. If you, do it, if you do this all the time, you don't really have to silver polish your horn at all. Got a question. Yes, can sir. You use, can you use um, ammonia Windex on not just your windows, but on a gold plated horn too? I wouldn't. There's a there's a reaction with the ammonia that yeah. is not good for metal in general. But um, ammonia free. Ammonia um, for, free. So, I mean, for gold plate, you just literally have to wipe it off with like some sort of microfiber. Yeah. Um, water and, maybe. Water doesn't. Yeah. With raw brass, I mean, you can use something that's very light and doesn't scratch and with lacquer my favorite thing to use and you're going to laugh at this one is pledge i i know that trick it's a great trick yeah, yeah and it yeah. smells good way better than a trumpet should Le smell lemon scent yes <laughs> i smell that trumpet i almost died so <laughs> clark terry when he got his first trumpet his teacher said to coat the inside in the lead pipe in the lead pipe with buttermilk and leave it in the case for a week come on this honest to god's truth you know, and so he did 
He did that. And then he opened up the case and threw up violently because it was the most wretched smell he'd ever smelled. Talk about red rot. You know, a yeah, lot of right? the timers, my dad, Maynard used to do it. A lot of guys would always do. When you put your horn away, I always think it was just, I do it now to all my horns. Um, you know, you get all the, all the uh, condensation. That's mm -hmm. a nice word of saying spittle. Yep. Get all the yes. spit out of the horn. Very Try professional. Get, you know, the lead pipe. Bob Reeves makes, I love Bob Reeves because he makes a lead pipe swab. swab yes. Um, yep. drives it, you know, but you know, try to get all the water out of the horn as much as you But yes. you can't. You, the old timers would take va regular valve oil and put like five, six drops in a lead pipe. And they say it would coat the lead pipe. So, yep. it, and believe it or not, it's kept my lead pipes cleaner. Yes. Now, I, I remember seeing, I don't know if it was Bob Malone, he poured a whole bottle of valve oil into a horn and then put the horn to an air compressor and blew all of that oil through the horn to coat it. I mean, think about it. If we talk about wave efficiency, not to quote another guy. Back there. <laughs> yeah, baby, do it. I do, the, I do the air compressor on all my horns all the you time. See? It's, it's, it's not, it's like the horns that have smooth inner parts that's why you should swab out your lead pipe you know <clears throat> people out there a lot of times i don't but I, uh, I won't tell you about the most disgusting horn i've ever cleaned but it was similar to the clark terry buttermilk story <laughs> so 40 years and it never been cleaned at all so oh my God. even you imagine that ouch yeah. i'll tell you a quick story you know I did, my first traveling gig was of a circus band um, oh my and, gosh wow and um it was a small circus band like three three piece I remember getting off the tour and every intermit um, every intermission, I would eat cotton candy, man. I love cotton candy. I would, and I go play my horn. Not even thinking I used to play a 59 con constellation. That was my dad's. I got off the tour, like wait, wait a couple of weeks. I didn't want to play. I, you know, cause I was, I really hurt my chops on that. Mm. And uh, I go to play and nothing comes out of the horn. I'm like what the hell? My dad looks at the leaf it was filled with cotton candy. The sugar expanded <laughs> in the horn and it was like what the heck that's when i learned man you really got to clean your horn out it's kind of important yeah, yeah right yeah. i was i did a video a few weeks ago at the shop before the shop closed down and it was this great horn it was made by my friend mike del quadro who makes amazing oh, mike's trumpets. great guy yeah. i love mike he's a good dude amazing trumpets and i and i got it and you know and i was playing it i was like man this trumpet's great and then i do it in the video and i was like man there's something <laughs> I'm still playing and it still sounds okay, but it doesn't sound as okay. And I look and the tuning slide is a motto key, you know, open. and it was half, half open. Mm -hmm. So it was like, oops. And I was like, hold on people. Brum, 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 brum. And the horn went, oh, the sound like just exploded through the horn. So, but um, yeah. Hey, while we're on, uh, while we're on the subject of maintenance, um, how often <laughs> how often do you recommend bathing a trombone we're still trying to make sure the baby's kept clean i don't remember cleaning mm. my french horn in six years i played asking for oh, my going, teenager going to bathtub with the speedo yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note i'm gonna turn off the camera <laughs> you want me to show you how to clean it <laughs> Take the slide. <laughs> we just hit the PG thirteen oh, NC no. seventeen rating. <laughs> oh, sorry, Stephen. You you answer that one. I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> uh, bathing trombones is not my forte. I don't. Know. <laughs> it's the same thing yeah. as a trumpet. It's, I mean, it's, it's the same, same concept. Get the uh, yeah. get the water out of it. You know, mm -hmm. you want to put water in it. You got to get out of it. So have a yeah. you know. I, Trent can tell you cleaning kits are a beautiful thing um yeah. you know get the right cleaning kit for the horn good swab good brush yes. mm -hmm. yep it's get pretty common if at the very at the very basic minimum make sure you especially now to be honest with you make sure you what you disinfect your mouthpiece every day yeah. i mean like I, so important like i do this before i you know and actually this stuff versus most mouth using? what is that so these guys were next to me at TMEA, and this is this is actually very. It doesn't taste like a typical mouthpiece spray, which yeah, most mouthpiece sprays stuff. are just pure isopropyl alcohol, yeah. which this does have it in it, and it's not the best taste, but at least and it smells quite good. Um, yeah, this I do this every morning before I play, and then like yeah. two or two or three times a week, I'll rinse out my mouthpiece in water. 
-hmm. I swab out my horn every day. Uh, and then um, I don't have to give it, if I do that, um, I don't have to give my horn a bath that much at all. Because you're keeping on it. You're not... One big thing, folks, this is something I tell my, my students all the time and all my customers. Um, you can over you can over oil valves, but when we're talking about a valve instrument, valve oil is cheap. Rebuilding valves is not cheap. And it's a skill like there was a big plating company uh, called Anderson Silver Plating. And they're still around. They do all of box plating. They do all of my mouthpiece plating. They do mouthpiece plating for a, a, a great portion of the, the industry. Um, they used to do all of my valve rebuilds, but then the person that did them retired and they couldn't train the next person to be oh, wow. as good as that person. Wow. There, there still are people in the States that do this work, um, uh, but now they are really backlogged because of that. Um, so, you know, oil your valves because, you know, the valves lose their functionality over 20, 30, 40, 50 years partially due to the fact that we it's like driving a car without changing the oil okay it comes to a point where no bueno yeah. so you know that i'm gonna even say that too the old timers told me and i do it with all the horns i put oil in the lead pipe when i'm done and i oil my valves when i'm done playing yeah not just before when i'm done playing it's really odd because I you know that famous bud hersett story right no. bud was Bud was on stage getting ready to play. The, it was a piece. It wasn't Mother 5, but it was another piece that started with a very exposed trumpet solo. Yeah. And one of his valves was sticking right before the conductor went for the cue. And it, it was stuck. And he goes, hold on. He takes out his valve. He fixes it. He put the wrong valve in. So he was trying to fix one, but he fixed two. You know, because there's a lot of pressure. So the guy's going like this. And it's, so I think what you just said is super super good advice at the end of your practice session just put, mm -hmm. put a few drops on and pat your horn away say good job you know, tomorrow you know. hey tomorrow why don't you do what i'm telling you to do so you know i had a i had a person also it, it, especially now since people are home more the placement of where you keep your instruments is also very important too. So if you're if you're oiling the valves when you're done with your practice session, but come back and they're dried out already, I actually had a, a, a younger student talking to me the other day. How come my valves are always dry? And I'm like, well, where's your trumpet stand at home? And he's like, well, it's in my room. I was like, is it near the heating register? And the heater, the, the forced air heat from the furnace was actually drying the horn out every single day. I was like, move your horn and you won't have as big of a problem well, yeah. but uh and with with a petroleum oil horn i'm like most valve oil even if they call it synthetic mm -hmm. there's a combination of elements so the the byproduct from petroleum valve oil is paraffin wax for the most part so over the course of time that wax builds up and then your valves six Don't months a year two years start slowing down that's why you have to take it to a shop and get it professionally ultrasonically clean yeah. because we have fancy ass machines that will take away that. Yeah. So it's not, it's not gimmickry folks. It's like, <laughs> I, there are a lot of customers and that actually gives me a, a little bit of a tangent. A lot of people come in, they want a new horn. And I, and I say, man, you have a great instrument. It's just filthy. Why don't I clean it? And I won't charge you. If you buy another horn, I won't charge you for the cleaning. And, but I said, wait until I get it done cleaning, come back in an hour. They come back, they play like three notes and they go, oh my God, what was I thinking? Yeah. And it's like, Clean and they're like, but don't you want to sell me a horn? I was like, I just did. Basically you have a new horn. Yep. So there, it's not, it's, you know, like some people think that getting your horns professionally serviced is like this, it's like mystical almost. <laughs> like there's these like little elves that hang out in their tree all night and they come down and they like sit on the ultrasonic machine. Mm -hmm. This is legit. This is a tried and true, yeah, you know, yep. just if you have a horn with red rot, please do not put it in the ultrasonic machine. Take your horn to a real competent tech, yeah. you know, a lot, a lot of stores, mom and dad pop stores and I'm a mom and dad pop store. Okay. But uh, like a lot of these big stores have people that work on instruments, make sure that you trust them because these are your life. I've seen so many, unfortunately see horns come into my shop that have been not so great serviced. So cool.
I want to go down a couple of these. I know, I know we're kind of awesome. getting long. I really appreciate everybody for hanging. Oh. So um, uh, it's been fun. <laughs> you guys play off of each mm -hmm. other well. It's kind of nice. So, no, not at all. <laughs> high five. <laughs> Virtual high five. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh. I'll, I'll put you guys next to each other. Go. <laughs> um, Which way should I go? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> that was my Elaine dance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, couple quick things. Um, I did not call him out last time, so I'm making the point to do it. Matt Winters, Matthew Winters says hello. Yeah, yeah. Matt will, you know, let me tell you about my boy, Matt. <laughs> you know, Matt's got me by about a foot. He's all muscle. And he's one of New York's finest, man. Matt Winters is a good friend of ours. And uh, yeah, man, you don't want to mess with Matt. Oh, Matt will eat you up, bro. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm calling him out by name this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Matt's Matt's one of those good people. He's a New York City police officer. Oh man, uh, yeah. thank you guy. so much. He's on the front lines, taking care of everybody, and we appreciate your service, my man. Yeah, thank yeah, you for definitely. everything. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um, Jordan Canner, Trent's videos are awesome. A lot of knowledge about the equipment and great playing. Nice little shout out for Trent there. Yeah. Um, Checks in the mail. Don't cash it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carl Drew Lab. Nice spot on TV with Charlie Belcher this morning. Oh, yeah. Nice, oh, my man Drew. Yeah, it was uh, very fortunate. We had a nice. Uh, it was early this morning, seven fifty-five. We had a nice little spot from this little yeah. YouTube video we did, and Charlie Belcher is uh, man. You know, it's amazing how sometimes trumpet is um looked at with the general public it's like man you know <clears throat> oh you play trumpet and they're either like oh this you know it's not positive or i played trumpet when i was a kid or and charlie was all about it man he was all about you know um all, all, you know he's he charlie belcher is um he he was uh the, one of the interviewers so he, he did charlie he had a spot for us um charlie called charlie's world but um he's into music and you could tell man he was really mm -hmm. passionate when we did the interview, which was actually a Zoom interview last week, man, we was like Trent and I, and we talked for about 20 minutes prior. Just, you know, you could tell. Again, it comes out in their personalities. And he, it was very, uh, very lucky to do that this morning. Yeah. yeah. Sure beats working, right? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it sure beats working. <laughs> yeah. And for anybody that's watching, uh, if you didn't get to see the spot, you can go over to Carl's Facebook page and the whole, uh, yeah, whole it was interview on, is there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So, um, great. We have uh, Brian R. asking a question. I, I actually, I think this would be interesting for both of you to answer. Um, what are your different warm up routines before a gig? Well, what what is a gig? <laughs> okay, that was too real. <laughs> Ten, I tend not to warm up before a gig. Just I'll let Carl talk about this more because his 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 world is way more, you know, I know he has a regimen and routine, but for me, um, I warm up at home. And if it means I have to wake up earlier, I get my work done and, uh, I'll play maybe one or two notes before I hit, hit the stage. Oh, wow. So, I never knew that. That's kind of I only have so many notes, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like Miles said, there's only 12 of them. <laughs> right, I'm going to run out quick. Yeah. What yeah. about you though? It, it's interesting. Um, there's two schools of thought. Maynard was the same way, man. Maynard could play two notes uh, and, and, and jump on stage. Um, later on in his life, um, he had to warm up more. But we always had a joke. He'd say, oh, warming up is a weakness. You know, kind oh, of wow. Like, you know, he's like, oh, you're warming up. That's a weakness. But realistically, Maynard actually had a very good regimen. And um, it worked for him. Um, but also, you can't rely so much on you know, it's like being a weightlifter. You want to kind of spot train differently. So, you know, one day I might be doing, um, you know, I might be able to crank out 50 push-ups, and the next day I'll, I'm going to instead of push-ups, I'll do curls. I'm working different muscle groups. Same thing mm -hmm. in my in, in my um, my warm up and my routines. I try to hit as many different facilities. Uh, my my fingers flexibility. Um, you know, long tones, uh, pedal tones, uh, more uh, finger exercises breathing exercise attack. So, you know, it's very important to have a system 
and get that system uh, going and being able to throw a monkey wrench in that system is like, oh, have a gig right now? Oh, I got to play? Well, I have to wait, hang up. I got warm up for a half yeah. hour. That ain't going to happen. You know, yeah. Maynard would say the tour bus is going to show up and, you know, the tour bus is going to break down. Well, you know, yeah. You know, what if, up. go ahead. Sorry. Like what did Roger Ingram said it like a great way. He said, like, you're leaving your, 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 was it, you know, I'm going to think about that. But my first trumpet teacher, my first real experience with like a trumpet star was Chuck Finley. Yeah. And someone bet him 20 bucks. He couldn't play a double C for the first note of the day. And so literally he played one tuning C and then decimated a double C. And then he, you know, he's totally hung over and he goes, you don't need to warm up. And then, so I'm like, not uh, in ninth grade. I'm like, cool. Yeah, he goes, but this it. is why you should. Yeah. And you and I have probably had experiences like you, the plane is late or you're delayed oh, and you're no. not going to make the gig. And you're literally walking on stage, pulling out your horn yep. and you got to hit it. So yeah. that's one of the reasons for me is to be, to have that adaptability. Yeah. Now, I also have, a, you know, when I, before I um, started with Adams, I worked a little bit with Shires and Doc was always in town sure. and Doc takes forever to warm up. Warm up yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's, I mean, if you ever hear Doc warming up, it's, it's painful at times and how like he can make such a beautiful sound. Like, and I would walk in like, Hey doc, how you doing? Grab a horn, and start playing. And I go, man, why do you do that? That's crazy, man. And, he, and I was like, and I was like, man, I don't need to warm up. And he just looked at me and he didn't hesitate because he's doc. And he goes, you will. Yeah. And, and like you said, with Maynard, as he aged, it changed. Mm -hmm. um, change, you know, monkey wrenches so, change too. That's what I mean. Oh, yeah. throw, throw a different routine in your set. You know, um, Absolutely. You know, but I actually have the same routine I've been doing for years and I throw monkey wrenches in it and I'll, I'll show up. There'll be times I'll come up here in my studio and just put the yeah. horn on my face and go, you know, yeah. it all depends I have a, on your workload. Yeah. I have three routines for my days. The first one is stamp. I call it a, the stamp. B are chick wits and C was today was a C day, which is, and people freak out at this, but I just picked up my horn and played today. Yeah. I mean, I'm and, gonna do it. and, uh, but that's actually, that's ABC. And, yeah. and some days, are C days and some days I'm like, wow, A really stunk yesterday. I need to do A again. But it's it's being, the, you know, I think especially now when we're all stuck at home, it's like I want to have so much fun while yeah. playing. Yeah. Um, you know, like I don't want to have to like be like, okay, I'm in hour two of my routine. I still do it. I mean, I, after I get done my stuff, I do Clark one through five, all the keys. I do Arbin's 20 through 33, wow. every exercise that takes like an hour and a half. Yeah, it's a and, it's, and I still suck at them. <laughs> That's yeah. the thing. It's the thing you can work on these things for years. I mean, you know, yeah. Clark things, I still work. I'm like, how yeah. did it go? I used to, I can play it today. I can't, it, it comes down to the Dizzy Gillespie thing. You know, mm -hmm. some days the horn wins, Pretty sometimes you win, you know? Well, and also and eventually you die and the horn wins again <laughs> there you go that's the well, real one yeah and also what's that I, I think maynard had a great quote that was that had to do with the fact that no one has ever mastered mastered the, the trumpet. trumpet and once no. you once you accept that and and he and he would go on to say you know in baseball three strikes before you're out so don't right. attach importance to missing you know, and that's I I know that we we actually leverage that that clip. Sometimes, Never attach importance, importance to missing a note. Correct. Uh, mm. Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right. I'm gonna flip the script here just a little bit. Um. What made you, Carl, decide to double up on saxophone? I know we've hit this before in past streams, I but maybe you can give a a a, a quick version. Uh, the quick version is I love Dexter Gordon. I always loved Dexter Gordon. There's a record called Cheesecake um, mm -hmm. that, you know, I loved. Um, I always liked Dexter. I always liked uh, that old school sound and decided to, uh, a friend of mine had a tenor and said, yeah, here's a tenor. And I wanted to just, I just was into it. And I, so I started playing this thing. I think I was like 17 or 18 and played it for maybe six months um, just because I wanted to learn. I want to actually learn the Dexter solo. So I learned a couple of Dexter solos. And then I think I started traveling and I needed the money and I sold the horn, never played. 
Um, mm. And then the Billy thing came up. And I didn't play. And, you know, it was just kind of a phase and came up to where um, they asked me, uh, there was some, a, a change in a band at that time. They asked me, oh, you know, we heard you played, uh, joking around. I told them I played, you know, I was at the Dexter. And so I j- basically it came back around like, well, I didn't have a horn. Uh, but the concept was if I got a good read, the read is like going to vibrate. It's going to make the sound get my fingers. So the next day, Mark Rivera is, um, you know, one of the, uh, the, 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 the main focus points of Billy's band for the last 39 years is wow. Billy's uh, sax player. He had me a Yamaha tenor on my door the next day. He's like, all right, come on, let's go. Got a couple cool. of reads and got my fingers going. I just, so I play parts with the band, you know, um, it just kind of fills out the band and it's kind of, it's interesting. Um, I can go on and on about it, but basically it's just, um, in this day and age, you have to do a lot of things. Well, you can't be a jack of all trades. I mean, it's hard to be a, a master of one thing and you're never going to master one thing anyway, but you know, you have to kind of switch it and be a utility guy. And that's kind of my role in Billy's band where you know, I have to blow on things, uh, blow on a lot of things to make a living and be consistent about it. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, but we've also been I think able to adds, that with I'm that sorry, I'm going to just jump in as an audience participant. I think it adds such a, a level of, well, one, as a musician, respect, but two, it's just way more interesting to see. <laughs> like, you, like, you're playing, all of a sudden you put the horn down, you put up the valve trombone, and then you're like, oh, I'm going to put the valve trombone, and then three seconds later, you're playing trumpet. I'm like, uh. And then you're like, okay, in the next song, you're singing backgrounds. Okay, the next song, and it's like, and you know, it's something as someone who's we have to still remember. I mean, this is and this is something that we forget because maybe we are so deeply focused on our technique and learning. Yeah. My favorite trumpet player is Clark Terry, not because he's he's obviously one of the greatest trumpet players who's ever lived. He's probably one of the best entertainers who's yeah. ever lived. Yeah. I mean, be it the upside down horn or the two horns yeah. or the mumbles. Yeah. He left every time we would go to a concert, you would leave just so positive and excited about music and life. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, I think that's one of my missions is to, 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 as a, at least when I play, um, is to also have that. I can get pretty serious on the horn. Sure. But it's like, it's way more important to have people leave with a smile and they'll remember your performance. Yeah. Tomas Gans, the first time I saw Tomas, he sat in at one of the sessions I hosted at ITG. This was the year that they played at, with nozzle brass and he's like oh i'm playing with this brass group you should come check it out and i'm like oh yeah brass group great and man i tell you that's the best concert i've ever been to because i i mean it was like your mind melted and i was like okay all right i i get it so this thing that i mean you might see well dude i only play tenor on like three it doesn't matter if you play it on one tune or 25 the fact that you just change it up it means like Oh man, that's hip. And I'm yeah. sure just in a business sense, you became way more marketable and a valued member of the group because you did that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, you know, it's, it's funny. Cause I get that question field a lot. What made you consider doing it? And it comes back to being, you know, you can't take yourself too seriously either. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? And, and, and it comes into the entertainment state. You know, if everybody wanted to be a uh, second trumpet player in a symphony orchestra, playing crescendos and, 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 and stuff like that, A, there's only a handful of those gigs, and B, that's not my personality. My personality is I want to have fun. I, you know, I mean, yes, just like you, I want to play to my best of my abilities, but part of the thing that drew me to Maynard and, and, and all these people were they were going to, to play. They weren't going to work. Yeah, of course. And you leave the gig happier than you as you came. That's a pretty cool thing. You know? Yeah. I remember Clark saying to me once, he goes, man, do you believe we get paid for this shit? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the first bad word I've said, but I still remember it. Hey, I mean, it, and this it was, took us this two hours to get there. Late in the you know, sorry. No, go ahead. I walked over here. Oh, no, he just, I mean, this was like, he was in really bad health and he had so many, like, you know, like he could barely see. We had to wheel him out on stage. And he was, you know, I mean, he said that afterwards, though. He was having so much fun. And he's like, man, do you, can you believe we get paid for this shit? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah, man. So. Nice. Well, it took us two hours to get to the first hearse, so we're doing good. 
Um, and I did it. You didn't, Carl. You nailed it, man. <laughs> Life's still right. not over yet. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, lightning, lightning but round. What else you got, Stephen? Okay, we're we're in the lightning round phase. Mm-hmm. One one piece of advice from both of you for an amateur improviser on learning to shed changes. I'm gonna let my favorite guest here go for it. <laughs> the other guests couldn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. I actually still have sound issues. Um, I knew the all mine, but the personality. Well, thanks, baby. Brother. Yeah. You ever heard that story about Louis Armstrong's? There was a clarinetist that uh, Peanuts, I think it was Peanuts Huckle. Arvel Shaw told me this story. Um, player, yeah. It's one of my favorite musician stories. I have to tell it. I'm sorry. And then we'll get to that. I promise. So lightning. Our, uh, <laughs> Lightning. Lightning. <laughs> <laughs> Storm. No, go ahead. You, think I follow, you think I follow rules? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. So, That's great. Um, anyways, uh, this guy was jiving pops on the gig. He had subbed this really? clarinet. Yeah, this, this clarinet is jiving Louis Armstrong on the gig. And we know Louis Armstrong is being this happy, jovial pops, right? Yeah. So on the set break, he brought his friends into the green room and they're all like, look, I'm playing with Louis Armstrong. It's the whoa. And he goes, hey, Pops, hey, Pops, hey, Pops, hey, Pops. When's the last time we played together? And Pops, without hesitation, just turns around and goes, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's so great. Um, first and foremost, if you are obsessed with chord changes, which it depends on the song, but if you're playing a standard song, like Carl, name a standard song that you really like playing. Uh, I can't get started. All right. So yeah, of course I can name you all the chords and the, oh, we got the chromatic two fives happening on the third, fourth bar of the A section and the B section goes to D major concert. And, okay. But the melody is always your, your, your God. biggest thing. So. <laughs> around the melody here's another great lewis armstrong line and i love this line never play the same way twice now he's not saying to screw up mm-hmm. but he's saying that you can interpret a melody so many different ways so say you're playing a song like a beautiful love which is a great standard victor young that you can learn now that song you could play a g scale through most of it to be honest but then you could start experimenting with notes around the melody. Clark Terry told me once, never forget the sweet note. And I actually have a mini lesson on this. You can go to my site and there's a, I have a whole bunch of free mini lessons on there, but there's this thing called sweet note. You know what a sweet note is, Carl? The one with the most color or a seven? Yeah. Okay. You know what it is, but the thing, yeah, no, you're totally on it. Um, The thing about it. And I never, I was so scared to ask Clark this, you know? So he would tell me when I would play with him, man, you got to play those sweet notes, sweet notes. And I was like, man, does one note taste better than I just don't get it. I didn't say it. Um, so then I was hanging with Herb Pomeroy. Herb Pomeroy taught at Berkeley Music. He played with Charlie Parker in 1950, yeah. played in Ellington's band. And I said, hey, man, he said the same thing to me. And I was like, okay, I can ask you this. What is a sweet note? And he goes, this is going to be boring to the people out there. It's called a non-diatonic chord tone. Mm-hmm. You had mentioned it than seven or the nine but in this case it's in the melody often the melody tells you those notes to play so if i'm playing on this song so when i'm playing i'm going to get to that whatever i'm not going to bore you with playing but the thing about it The thing about it is we obsess about chord change. We obsess about that. Now, Mm -hmm. functionality is good. You want to learn this, but if you can't interpret the melody a bunch of different ways, 
a bunch of different ways where you can make the, there's a reason why melodies are there. They sound good. I think we forget that and we're like, look, you go this. Yeah. Play 10 courses of the melody every time, trying to develop an idea, playing around the melody, record yourself, and then really importantly, listen to yourself. A lot of people, they don't listen to themselves play, so they have no idea what they're doing. Yep. You record yourself on any device today, it's ridiculously good in terms of the quality, and then guess what? If you don't like it, you press that little trash can on the side and it's gone. Yep. So, um, but the sweet note thing is huge. Like take the A train, you know? Or in the bridge, it, the bridge is in G major. Then we get that G sharp, which is not in the key of G major. That should be an important note to play. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's our know? rules. If you're playing in a in a chord scale based structure or bebop language, that when you're playing a solo on that song. And if you listen to the Ryan Kaiser Plunger solo uh, with the Lincoln Center video, which is one of my favorite solos, or the Lou Soloff Lincoln Center A Train solo, mm -hmm. they play this language. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're vastly different players. Clark Terry played that language. Don Cherry, there's a great recording of Don Cherry actually playing A Train with Herbie. Of all things, he plays that language, even though he plays it in the Don Cherry way, Boy. which is really sorry. That was a huge tangent. I'm very passionate about that. No, I love it, man. Sorry, it was a I'm lightning just, storm. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just going to, for lack of a better word, and I used this word last week. It's a very big word for a trumpet player. Embellish. I'm going to embellish <laughs> what Trent said. You know, I made it a point to playing you guys a blues melody when we first started Doxy last week. I think I played uh, another blues melody. Um, but so Trent touched on these things, embellishing or, you know, not playing the melody the same way twice or embellishing the melody. Like I took happy birthday last week. I played derivatives of that. Um, however, um, you get a little bit deeper. Um, you know, there's a great number of uh, chord studies and, um, you know, the great Barry Harris is probably mm -hmm. one of the most simple, not simplest, but the most uh, intuitive, just like the way he approaches chord changes and the way he can tell you what to play on top of them is just that in itself is, you know, so check that out harmonically. But where Trent was going with the melody is, I talked about this last week, listen to singers. You know, mm. I, I'm very, very fortunate. I have one of the, I look at Billy Joel is like a Gershwin of our time. Absolutely. The way he crafts a melody and the way he actually lyric, lyric, lyrically, not only does he be able to sing a beautiful lyrical line, but put intent in the lyrics with it. Know what those lyrics mean. Know when the intent of where that song is going. And that comes back to the old timers. I talked about Billy Mitchell, who was a great tenor player with uh, Count Basie's band. Mm -hmm. Frank West, who was with Count Basie's band. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dexter, all these guys, all these old tenor players, man, used to yell at me about, I, I didn't know Dexter, but, you know, Frank used to tell me and Billy Mitchell, learn, if you're going to play a standard, know the melody inside and out. And then also, uh, I also heard the sweet notes were the colored notes. Play the colored yeah. notes. You know, play totally. the colors, you know. And, yeah. and so jump on those things and but, you know, that's an easy way. But um, also, I just, you know, we're, I think Trent and I are also students. I seen a book online the other day. Bob Mincer, Bob Shepard, and Dave Lehman have a book out right now. Three Woo. tenor players. Uh, and well, Lehman plays soprano. <laughs> and it's all about diatonic harmony. And just, you know, and it's like very... It's written, I, I can't wait to buy the book. It's very, you know, so there's enough information to really get into the core changes and stuff like that. And there's a lot of schools you can really learn, but it comes down to when I hear scholastic players playing patterns and things, you could tell they're not really intent on knowing the melody and knowing, telling the story of what you want to tell in your improvisation. Yeah. It's very important. 
having a meeting. Oh yeah. So breach. Cool. <laughs> All right, Trent. Trent, this one's coming to you first. Uh -oh. Is there a compromise between getting the perfect mouthpiece sound wise and being able to play on a long gig with the proper amount of stamina? I know that's a that's a, a mouth that's a, that's <laughs> a mouthful. A deep question, aren't they? Because it's like, how does one build stamina? Do they do they expect it to be built with a mouthpiece? Now I will say you do not run a uh, well. Let me back up. I don't run a marathon at all, but if I were to run a marathon, I wouldn't wear dress shoes. Um, I'd find the best match. Um, how does one get endurance? This is going to be a challenge for all of us, actually, right now. How are we going to have endurance when we're not gigging? Because there's there's endurance in the shed, and then there's endurance on the stage, which are totally different things. You know, um, I know Carl can definitely preach on that one. It's like, um, but, uh, oh, yeah, Roger Ingram, don't leave your chops in the practice room. That's what it is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, like, you know, man, he sounds great warming up, but, man, he's going to leave those chops in the practice room. But um, yep. you have to build endurance so you can play. Now, you won't know. This is a hard one, too, because it's like you were talking about the circus, Carl. I knew I sucked when I started playing Big Apple Circus with guys like oh, Rob. Wow. Man, Rob's con the conducting the Big Apple Circus. He's on a trap. He's like on a tight wire going down from the ceiling, playing a double high D while conducting the band. Yeah. Did I mention he's on a trapeze or whatever? Yeah. Crazy. And he sounds perfect. And then he walks up to the stage, grabs a piccolo, and then crushes piccolo trumpet. It's like, whoa. And he does four shows a day yeah. that's endurance so that's endurance. a lot of endurance is learned you have to build it in for me when i have to play things like that which i i'm fortunate and in some aspects where i don't but if i have a if i have to do like two or three gigs in one day which has happened to me a couple times here in kc um i know that i'm gonna do it and caruso comes out and i pull out the caruso and i get i get to it carl speak on this because you have way more experience than i well, do on this no, you know, I mean, everybody has their uh, secret potion to kind of help out, but indirectly and directly. Um, I remember being Maynard's valet, which is personal assistant when I was on Maynard's band, beginning for three, four years and going to his house all the time. And he had a, um, when I first joined, he had a boom box, he had a road case with a big boom box. A boom box was, a, you know, a big stereo, all one piece. And he had a road case. The thing was really loud. And I remember going to his house and him playing to the tracks of the band and him playing over it and playing the whole set. Mm. Like, I do this every, I do this every day, a um, couple of days before I go on the road to get my, to, to mimic my gig stamina. So he would play along to the set prior cool. and I'd bring that boom box out in the road case and he would check out stuff or if you had a couple of days off. You know, if you felt like he wasn't strong enough or whatever, he played at a boom box. Um, he was very easy to say once we got to the gig, he goes, nothing replaces the, on the gig demand. You know, you can't get a boom box loud enough and the energy. Um, but we're going to go into something uh, again. It's a Maynardism. And I talked about this with Steve and you can attest to my last studio date in August when I recorded the record uh, for yeah. Ted Eye. You know, when you're playing correctly is when your socks are wet, Maynard would say, mm -hmm. with breathing. You know, um, so the Pravarati stance, uh, using your air to your best advantage, not pressing and pulling into, the, into your chops with the mouthpiece and stopping the vibration. And what he meant well, by sweating from his socks at the end of the gig, he was most of the times when Maynard was on, he, his energy demand was at the, you know, he was stronger at the end of the gig. Mm -hmm. And he knew when he was playing right. And I remembered, man, he would take his shock socks and shoes off and they would be, be soaking wet. I'd be like, what the heck? And I would remember. So I remember, um, you know, we we're Stephen, we were in the second day of recording. I had like eight, eight hour recording days. And, mm -hmm. But the second day, finally, my chops felt dialed in. And I think we recorded the Maynard medley that day. Yep. And I was playing stuff I haven't played in months because I was, you know, you, you know, you kind of, after a while, you kind of get to know your body, but it's very simple, man. Air, you're a human air compressor. And the, when you stop the vibration here, you know, you have to get, you have to get into your muscle memory and, mm. and your routines. That's why I stress routines so much. 
and know, you know, know what your routines feel like and rely on that muscle memory, getting good muscle memory to l let you rely on your air a little bit more. And that will help you out with stamina. So awesome. Yeah, good stuff. Answer. Well, there's a, a double answer for you, Dan. Yeah. Um, Bruno's checking in from Brazil saying hello. Bruno! Bruno. Um, <clears throat> Allison says, thank you for justifying my multiple mouthpiece purchases for the high school trombone player. <laughs> um, Laura, I'm holding off on my last half hour of practice for this. Awesome. Thanks Ooh, for sticking around, Laura. <laughs> um, Nathaniel okay. Wilford. Hey, guys. Uh, ah! Trent and Carl. You heard this play? Nate, he's a bad cat, man. Is he? I, we should be scared? I'm scared now. Scary. Yeah, you watch video. Check out some videos of him on YouTube. He's like 14 or 15. He's already playing along with Maynard. And he sent me a clip yesterday on the cell phone of him playing uh, the Wayne thing on roller coaster. Oh, wow. The dirty loop. Killing it. Killing it. I'm like, dude. Good. Yeah, awesome, he's a bad man. cat, man. Can't wait awesome. to hear him. All right. Yeah, Bring it on. Daniel says, uh, wait. Trent and Carl, some of his favorite players. Um, Man, he's got to get his he got to get his ears cleaned. I think. What? <laughs> what? Who? What are you um, talking about? <laughs> let's see. Thank you. I lost my place here. Uh, Dan says thanks so much, guys, for your time, experiences, and knowledge. Okay. Um, Chris Kemp says great hang. Chris. And, Chris uh, Kemp. Oh yeah. man. Oh, I have your buzz kill somewhere. I've got to do a video on it. Oh, it's upstairs. I have another place I practice in my house. And um, that Chris is an awesome trumpet player, but he also made this amazing device to help buzz your mouthpiece. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. it's got like adjustable resistance. It's really freaking hip. So not only that is he's a great cartoonist. Well, yeah, he's the character, the character, <laughs> my little caricature was from Chris. So. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Is ACBY, right? Yeah. Like keep my calm? keep calm and uh, carry on. So Chris, man, Chris, I, I you know, I got to find tell. it. You did a thing for me when I was, Gar I think with Gary and Brian from um, Brian Scriber, all the, well, you know, you Canadian guys, even though Gary's <laughs> not Canadian, but yeah, he did a car, uh, a character. I got to look for it. Now. I don't know where that went. Just really, really talented. Hey, Chris, hope you're well, man. Hanging tough. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think that that might be it. Oh, there was there was one other one that I held off on. Trent, you talked about Clark Terry a lot. It actually yep. brought up brought up some good memories from my father, who says back in oh. high school um, they won the class two A jazz competition, and that night um, basically the winner got to perform with Clark. Oh, cool! So, Woo so my dad got to I play with Clark Terry. <laughs> Yeah. So this is Clark, you know, he's, he's on the front lines for education in terms of my, I grew up in a small town in central Maine about uh, if you've been to Maine, if you hear, if you drive to Portland, it's an hour from the New Hampshire border, drive three wow. more hours North. And that's where we lived. Were you um, near Moosehead Lake? Where were you? Yeah, where? absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Moosehead. Yeah. Beautiful. Dude, most beautiful place in, in the world. I think it is. My friend had a go couch, island. Beat him, go out. Uh, you can go up that couch if you don't trade. But anyway, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> for sure, you know what I'm saying. My grandfather did a full lobstrap thing. You can't even tell what to talk about. So you always gotta stick something down here. And um, but anywho, um, Clark Terry, and this is way before I went to Nokomis. That's the high school I went to. We didn't have a football team, but we had like five jazz bands at one time. I mean, it was like so playing lead trumpet in the jazz band was like that. Um, but Clark Terry basically started that program by doing a concert with their high school big band. This goes back to that comment in 1980. And I have the cassette tape of him playing with like a main rhythm section. He's, he is disgustingly smoking it. I mean, he is burning like beyond compare. And that's the thing. It's like, you never know. And Carl, I know you do this. And that's why I love you, man. It's because like, you never know who's in the audience. Yeah. Who can be like it can change their life i mean it's like oh. i snuck into my first experience with clark was i was a junior in high school he we went down to the unh jazz festival i ended up going to unh but we went down with our high school jazz band and they had played a concert at lunch and clark was in really bad health actually i think he went to the hospital that night mm -hmm. but um he was playing with phil woods and i ran out of the cafeteria to, to his green room because i had no i i just 
that was me. I just didn't give a shit. Um, and I was like, Mr. Terry, ah, I love you. I play upside down. And, and he's like, hey, kid. <laughs> and there, and but it was just like this passion. This and it's like, you know, it's great. And I, I, I thank you guys for like allowing me to like smile, think about that. Just it's like because I had a bad time a few years ago playing. The shop got to me. I got really stressed out about having the business, sure. and yeah. and I was actually doing a, a a series of gigs up in Maine with Tomas Conch, just us two trumpet players, and either nice. with a high a college big band or rhythm section. Beautiful. And I was really dark, like super dark. And uh, and he said, and I was like, man, I just think I'm going to quit because the business is too hard. Life yeah. is too hard. And and um, he said this to me, and this changed my life. I mean, in a great way, I think. He goes, don't you remember how much fun it was to play when you were a kid? And it's like, with all of our stress of life, there was a point where every single person who's watching this video had that moment. Yeah. Now, why don't you have that moment all the time? Seriously, there's no, ex I, I, I don't want to say there's excuse. Yes, of course. There's, yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on in case you haven't watched the news, but, um, <laughs> hmm. but I play out of that world now and yeah, maybe I'm not the best player I don't care about that, which is also a beautiful thing. I know there's always going to be somebody better than me. I know that that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, yet I'm not willing to settle on where I am as a player today. And that's also a good thing. But I play like I was 14 years old again, not, not terribly and not <laughs> with like no, no drive and no intention, but I play because I absolutely love to play. Yeah. It shows. That's why I wanted to oh, do yeah, a baby. thing with you today too, because that passion shows. And you know, a lot of people view you. Uh, they hear you playing great, but I like you know getting behind the the, the mind of the whole thing is. To me, wow. that's what I take out of this. It's like, but I wasn't there. I wasn't there. There was a point in my life where I wasn't there, and it was not that far. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Um, I, it's a weekly thing with me, or daily thing. I think I everybody's. Yeah. I think everybody's experiencing that. And I think it's for, it's one thing for us to tell them. It's like, you, dude, you are so not alone. I mean, we are yeah. all there, but now, like, especially now, this is the one thing that I'm really passionate about all the people that I talk to. And I'd said it, I've done a few of these podcasts and interviews. I was like, anybody who's out there who plays an instrument, one, either play for your neighbors. We did a parade in our neighborhood, just three people, my wife who played melodica, my assistant Kyle, who lives about a mile away, and myself. Kyle we were just Kyle. walking around playing Saints and it cool. and it brightened people's day and we were having a blast. Awesome. Six feet apart, don't worry. Yeah. And but you can you can play for your family, you can yeah. play for your friends. We do that crazy quarantine concert just enough to take someone's mind off what's going on, but also to remember that this is pretty fun. I mean, it's, we put a torture tube to our face, yes, but it's still pretty damn fun. Yeah. Okay, I gotta stop talking. I love it, man. Wait, wait hold yeah. on, I'll meet myself. That's a... <laughs> that's a great, uh, if we don't have any more questions, I think that's a great way to kind of push this to the next level, which is yeah. the conclusion. Um, Stephen, are there any more pertinent questions that we should hit, or we? No, I, you know what? I think that I think that that's a good spot, and um, I definitely uh, want to give Trent a second, um, if you don't mind, Trent, if you would give out like your website and stuff like that. I'll yeah, definitely... but before we do that, that oh, will be the last ahead. thing. I just want to ask. I I got a question for Trent. Uh oh, shoot. Uh oh. And then, then then I want Trent to do his own. What do you have coming up in the future? What that excitement that you just showed us, fourteen year old kid. What excites you, whether it be a player, whether it be jazz, whether it be pop, whether it be a music right. store, whether it be mel meal at Adams, what in the future gets you excited? What, and just one thing that just is, that we can look forward to that, that interest trend. At least not necessarily one thing that interests me on my birthday, I bought, and this is pretty out there, but I bought, uh, to help support a musician and, uh, who's not having any gig income right now. Um, I think the, the greatest trumpet player in the world is a guy named Peter Evans. He's um, 
he lives in Portugal now, but he was, um, I think he's from Norwood, Mass. But Peter Evans has the single best clip of trumpet on the internet. Just type in Peter Evans' Body and Soul. It's eight and a half minutes of unaccompanied trumpet. Really? I bought his entire discography of, uh, about a month ago. And I've been listening. How many times you just put, this is another opportunity that you have, put the headphones on and l truly enjoy music. And his music's pretty out, I'll, I'll, I'll preface that. Yeah. But it's like, I've never, he does stuff on the trumpet that no one else does. Like oh, that's great. He's, in, he's taken the bar. You think about Louis Armstrong taking the bar and then Roy, El Roy Eldridge took that and raised the bar. Dizzy raised the bar. Clifford raised the bar. Freddie raised the bar. Um, and in classical world, it can be, sure. you know, it could be Don Smithers or Marie Sandre or sure. Sergei Nikarikov or Alan Vizzuti. You name them. Yeah. Peter Evans has taken the entire instrument now. Wow. And oh, dude, it's okay. it's intense. And most people will not like the music, and that's cool. But it's ridiculously scary awesome so th that's what i'm doing uh nothing personally other than i'm recording a lot and maybe i did a solo album in 2008 i think a solo trumpet album awesome. dozens of copies sold um <laughs> actually maybe not <laughs> <laughs> maybe not i'm doing another one of just standards so Good. um i released some of the stuff online i call them quarantunes uh, yeah. Some of the stuff's accompanied, some of it's unaccompanied, but the whole project eventually will be unaccompanied. So, okay. wow, and that's, that's enough great. about me. I'm sorry yeah. if you fell asleep during that. So. No, I love it, man. I, I, it loves it because it's, it's the, uh, again, it's that passion and thing that, that we look for and that excites us. So, Stephen, I appreciate your help, man. And uh, we appreciate oh, man, everybody pleasure. coming. And we're Thanks for the let honor. Trent, we, we uh, appreciate everything and you guys hanging. And I'm going to let Trent have last words with his website and the uh steven what you're gonna ask him website what else yeah just um you know if people want to check you out some more let them let them know where to go there's a youtube channel if you type me in you'll find some bad videos of me playing trumpet but some fun ones too um and just austincustombrass.biz um we'd love to talk shop with you anytime obviously awesome. thank you carl thank you steven this was an honor man so this this time went like that. And that's what makes it really fun. Exactly. So. I have to look at the clock. I'm like, wow, it's been, I know, right. Uh, we're going to be some tired puppies in the morning, but man, you're the, you're the first and best guest. And you're the best guest we ever had, Trent. <laughs> <laughs> Which also you're makes me guess. the worst. <laughs> <First one. laughs> I've you're monopolized number one. it. You're number one. We you're also number one. zero. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you, but, everybody. You guys thanks, sleep everybody. well. Peace. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.